the X-Files. Antibodies by Kevin J. Anderson. <laughs> Dimar Laboratory Ruins, Sunday, 11.13 p.m. Late in a night filled with cold mist and still air, the alarm went off. It was a crude security system hastily erected around the abandoned burn site, and Vernon Ruckman was the only guard stationed to monitor the night shift. But he got paid, and surprisingly well, to take care that no intruders got into the unstable ruins of the Dimar Laboratory on the outskirts of Portland, Oregon. He drove up the wet gravel driveway, shifted into park, and got out to investigate. He flicked on the beam of his official security flashlight, heavy enough to be used as a weapon, and shone it like a fire hose of light into the blackened ruins that covered the site. His employers hadn't given Vernon his own security vehicle, but they had provided him with a uniform, a badge, and a loaded revolver. In the weeks since the facility had been bombed, he had already chased a few trespassers away, teenagers who ran giggling into the night. Vernon had never managed to catch any of them. This was no laughing matter. The Dimar ruins were unstable, set to be demolished in a few days. Already construction equipment, bulldozers, steam shovels, and little bobcats were parked around large fuel storage tanks next to a padlocked locker that contained blasting caps and explosives. Someone sure was in a hurry to erase the remains of the medical research facility. In the meantime, this place was an accident waiting to happen, and Vernon Ruckman didn't want it to happen on his watch. He thought he heard movement inside the building, debris shifting, stone and wood stirring. Vernon swung the gate open wide enough for him to enter the premises. He paused to listen carefully, then proceeded with caution, just like the guidebook said to do. His left hand gripped the flashlight while his right hovered above the heavy police revolver strapped to his hip. He had handcuffs in a small case in his leather belt, and he thought he knew how to use them. Someone was indeed in there. Old ashes crunched under his feet, splinters of broken glass and smashed concrete. Vernon remembered how this research facility had once looked, a high-tech place with unusual modern northwestern architecture, a mixture of glossy, futuristic glass and steel and rich golden wood from the thick Oregon coastal forests. The lab had burned quite well after the violent protest, the arson, and the explosion. Vernon paused, shown his light around. He heard a sound, quiet rustling, a person intent on uncovering something in the wreckage. It came from the far corner an enclosed office area with a partially slumped ceiling where the reinforced barricades had withstood most of the destruction. He saw a shadow move there, tossing debris away, digging. Vernon swallowed hard and stepped forward. You there! This is private property, no trespassing! He rested his hand on the butt of his revolver. Show no fear. He wouldn't let this intruder run from him and escape as the teenagers always did. Vernon directed his flashlight onto the figure. A large, broad-shouldered man stood up and turned toward him slowly. The intruder didn't run, didn't panic, and that made Vernon even more nervous. Oddly dressed, the man wore mismatched clothes covered with soot. They looked like something stolen from a lost duffel bag or torn down from a clothesline. What are you doing here? Vernon demanded. He flared the light into the man's face. The intruder was dirty, unkempt and he didn't look at all well. Great, Vernon thought, a vagrant rooting around in the ruins to find something he could salvage and sell. There's nothing for you to take in here. Yes, there is, the man said. His voice was strangely strong and confident, and Vernon was taken aback. My name is Dorman, Jeremy Dorman. The man fumbled in his shirt pocket, and Vernon grabbed for his revolver. I'm just trying to show you my Dimar ID, Dorman said. Vernon took another step closer, and in the glare of his powerful flashlight, he could see that the intruder looked sick, sweating. Looks like you need to go to a doctor. No, what I need is in here, Dorman said, pointing. Vernon saw that the burly man had pulled away some of the rubble to reveal a hidden fire safe. Dorman finally managed to pluck a bent and battered photo badge out of his shirt pocket, a Dimar laboratory clearance badge. This man had worked here. But that didn't mean he could root around in the burned wreckage now. That means nothing to me, Vernon said. I'm going to take you in, and if you really have authorization to be here, we'll get this all straightened out. No, 
Dorman said so violently that spittle sprayed from his lips. For a moment it looked as if the skin on his face shifted and blurred, then reset itself to normal. Vernon swallowed hard but tried to maintain his stance. Dorman ignored him and turned around. Indignant, Vernon stepped forward and drew his weapon. I don't think so, Mr. Dorman. Get up against the wall right now. Vernon suddenly noticed the thick bulges underneath the man's grimy shirt. They seemed to move of their own accord, twitching. Dorman looked at him with narrow, dark eyes. Vernon gestured with the revolver. With a sigh, Dorman spread his hands against the soot-blackened wall and waited. The skin on his right hand was waxy, plastic-looking, runny somehow. Vernon wondered if the man had been exposed to some kind of toxic substance, acid, or industrial waste. Despite the reassurance of his gun, Vernon didn't like this at all. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw one of the bulges beneath Dorman's shirt squirm. Stand still while I frisk you! Dorman gritted his teeth and stared at the concrete wall in front of him, as if counting particles of ash. I wouldn't do that, he said. Don't threaten me, Vernon answered quickly. Then don't touch me, Dorman retorted. In response, Vernon tucked the flashlight between his elbow and his side, then quickly patted the man down, frisking him with one hand. Dorman's skin felt hot and strangely lumpy, and then Vernon's hand touched a wet, slick substance. He snatched his palm back quickly. Gross, he said. What is this? Vernon shoved the revolver back into his holster, and staring squeamishly at his hand, he tried to wipe the slime off on his pants. Suddenly his palm burned. It felt like a kind of acid eating deep into his flesh. Dorman lowered his arms and turned to watch. I told you not to touch me, he said. Vernon Ruckman felt all of his muscles lock up. Seizures racked his body. A thousand tiny fireworks exploded in his head. He couldn't see any more, other than bright psychedelic flashes, static in front of his vision. His arms and legs jittered, his muscles spasmed and convulsed. From inside his head he heard bones breaking, his own bones. He screamed as he fell backward, as if his entire body had turned into a minefield. The flashlight, still glowing brightly, dropped the ash-covered ground. Dorman watched the still-twitching body of the guard for a few moments before turning his attention back to the half-exposed safe. The victim's skin rippled and bubbled as large red-black blotches appeared in the destroyed muscle tissue. The guard's flashlight illuminated a brilliant white fan across the ground, and Dorman could see swollen growths, pustules, tumors, lumps. The usual. Dorman ripped away the last of the wall frame and the powdery gypsum from the burned sheetrock to expose the fire safe. He knew the combination well enough and quickly spun through the numbers, listening to the cylinders click into position. He swung open the door. But the safe was empty. Somebody had already taken the contents, the records, and the stable prototypes. He whirled to look at the dead guard, as if Vernon Ruckman somehow had been involved with the theft. He winced as another spasm coursed through him. His last hope had been inside that safe, or so he thought. Dorman stood up, furious. Now what was he going to do? He shuddered as minor convulsions trooped through his muscle systems, but taking deep breaths, he managed to get his body under control again. It was getting harder every day, but he vowed to keep doing whatever was necessary. Dorman had always done what was necessary. Sickened with despair, he wandered aimlessly around the ruins of Dimar Laboratory. He found a melted and broken desk, and from his placement he knew it had been David Kennessy's, the lead researcher's. Damn you, David, Dorman muttered. Using all his strength, he ripped open one of the top drawers, and in the debris there he found an old framed photograph, burned around the edges, the glass cracked. He peeled the photo out of the remnants of the frame. David smiled beside a strong-looking and pretty young woman with strawberry blonde hair and a tow-headed boy. Sitting in front of them, tongue lolling out, was the Kennessy's black Labrador, always the dog. The family portrait had been taken when the boy was eleven years old, before the leukemia had struck him. Patrice and Jody Kennessy. Dorman took the photo and stood up. He thought he knew where they might have gone, and he was sure he could find them. He had to. Now that the other records were gone, the dog's blood held the answer he needed. He would gamble on where they might go, where Patrice might think to hide. She didn't even know the remarkable secret their family pet carried inside his body. 
Walking over to the guard's body, Dorman removed the man's revolver and tucked it in his pants pocket. If it came down to a crisis situation, he might need the weapon in order to get his way. Leaving the cooling, blotched corpse behind him and taking the weapon and the photograph, Jeremy Dorman walked away from the burned Dimar laboratory. Inside of him, the biological bomb kept ticking. He didn't have many days left. FBI Headquarters, Washington, D.C. Monday, 7.43 a.m. The bear stood huge, five times the size of an all-star wrestler. Bronze-brown fur bristled from his cable-thick muscles. A Kodiak bear, a prized specimen. Its claws were spread as it leaned over to rip a salmon from the rocky stream, pristine and uninterrupted. Mulder stared at the claws, the fangs, the sheer primal power. Sometimes Mulder left his quiet and dim basement offices where he kept the X-Files just to come up and peruse the display case. Looking at the powerful bear, Mulder continued to be preoccupied, perplexed by a recent and highly unusual death report he had received, an X-File that had come across his desk from a field agent in Oregon. When a monster like this bear killed its prey, it left no doubt as to the cause of death. A bizarre disease raised many questions, though especially a new and virulent disease found at the site of a medical research laboratory that had recently been destroyed by arson. Unanswered questions had always intrigued Agent Fox Mulder. He went back down the elevator to his own offices where he could sit and read the death report again. Then he would go meet Scully. She stood behind the thick, soundproofed plexiglass partitions inside the FBI's practice firing range. Special Agent Dana Scully removed her handgun a new Sig Sauer 9mm. Squinting and focusing down the hairline, she squeezed the trigger in an unconscious reflex and popped off the first round. She paid no attention to where it struck, simply aimed and shot again, firing over and over. She thought of those shadowy men who had killed her sister, Melissa, who had repeatedly tried to silence or discredit Mulder in his admittedly unorthodox theories. Scully had to stay calm, maintain her firing stance, maintain her edge. If she let her anger and frustration simmer through her, then her aim would be off. She looked at the black silhouette of the target and saw only the featureless men who had entwined themselves so deeply in her life. Smallpox scars, nose implants, vaccination records, and mysterious disappearances, like her own, and the cancer that was almost certainly a result of what they had done to her while she had been abducted. She had no way to fight against the conspiracies, no target to shoot at. She had no choice but to keep searching. Scully yanked the paper target from its binder clip and left the gunshot spattered piece of support cardboard hanging in its place. She punched the computer controls to reset the target back to its average point and then looked up, startled to see her partner Mulder leaning against the wall in the observation gallery. She wondered how long he had been waiting for her. Good shooting, Scully, he said. He didn't ask whether she was simply doing target practice or somehow exercising personal demons. Spying on me, Mulder? she said, lightly trying to cover her surprise. After an awkward moment of silence, she said, All right, what is it? A new case. This one is going to capture your interest, no doubt about it, he smiled. She replaced her safety goggles on the proper hook and followed him. Even if they weren't always believable, Mulder's discoveries were always interesting and unusual. Case on Coffee Shop, Washington, D.C. Monday, 8.44 a.m. As Mulder led her out of the Hoover building, Scully wondered about the new case he had found, almost as much as she dreaded the coffee shop where he planned to take her. Even his off-handed promise, I'm buying, hadn't exactly won her over. Mulder set his briefcase on one of the cleared tables, then bolted for the cash register and coffee line as Scully took her seat. Can I get you anything, Scully? he called. Just coffee, she said, against her better judgment. Mulder came back with two large styrofoam cups. Getting down to business, he snapped open his briefcase and withdrew a manila folder. Portland, Oregon, he said. This is Dymore Laboratory, a federally funded cancer research center. He handed her a slick brochure showcasing a beautifully modern laboratory facility. Nice place, Scully said. I'm not aware of their work. Dymore tried to keep a low profile, Mulder said, until recently. What changed? Scully asked, setting the brochure down on the small table. Mulder removed the next item, a black and white glossy photo of the same place. 
This time the building was destroyed, gutted by fire, barricaded by chain-link fences, an abandoned war zone. Presumably sabotage and arson, Mulder said. The investigation is still pending. This happened a week and a half ago. A Portland newspaper received a letter from a protest group, Liberation Now, claiming responsibility for the destruction. But nobody's ever heard of them. They were supposedly animal rights activists upset at some of the research the lead scientist, Dr. David Kennessy, was performing. High-tech research, and a lot of it was classified. What was Kennessy's research? The information on that is very vague, Mulder said, his forehead creasing. His voice became troubled. New cancer therapy techniques. Really cutting-edge stuff. He and his brother Darren worked together for years in an unlikely combination of approaches. David was the biologist and medical chemist, while Darren came to the field from a background in electrical engineering. Electrical engineering and cancer research? Scully asked. Those two don't usually go together. Was he developing a new treatment apparatus or diagnostic equipment? Unknown, Mulder said. Darren Kennessy apparently had a falling out with his brother six months ago. He abandoned his work at Dymar and joined a fringe group of survivalists out in the Oregon wilderness. Needless to say, he isn't reachable by phone. So, did Kennessy continue his work even without his brother? Scully asked. Yes, Mulder said. He and their junior research partner, Jeremy Dorman. As far as I know, Kennessy concentrated on obscure techniques that have never been previously used in cancer research. Kennessy had apparently been threatened before, Mulder said. But this group came out of nowhere and drew a big crowd. I found no record of any organization called Liberation Now before the Dimar incident, until the Portland Oregonian received the letter claiming responsibility. Why would Kennessy have kept working under such conditions? Mulder withdrew another photo of a boy 11 or 12 years old. The boy was smiling for the camera, but looked skeletal and weak, his face gaunt, his skin gray and papery, much of his hair gone. This is his 12-year-old son, Jody, terminally ill with cancer, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Kennedy was desperate to find a cure, and he certainly wasn't going to let a few protesters delay his work, not for a minute. She rested her chin in her hands. I still don't see how an arson and property destruction case could capture your interest. Mulder removed the last photo in the folder. A man in a security guard's uniform lay sprawled in the burned ruins. His face twisted in a mask of agony. His skin blotched and swollen with sinuous lumps, arms and legs bent at strange angles. He looked like a spider that had been dosed with bug spray. This man was found in the ruins of the burned lab just last night, Mulder said. Look at those symptoms. No one has figured it out yet. Scully snatched the photo and looked intently at it. Her eyes showed her alarm. He appears to be dead from some fast-acting and exceedingly virulent pathogen. Mulder waited for her to absorb the gruesome details and then said, I wonder if something in Kennedy's research could be responsible, something that didn't entirely perish in the fire. Scully let her interest show plainly as she continued to study the photo. Look at those tumors. How fast did the symptoms appear? Well, the victim was apparently normal and healthy when he reported to work a few hours earlier. He leaned forward intently. What do you think this guard stumbled upon? Scully pursed her lips in concern. I can't really say without seeing it myself. Is this man's body being held in quarantine? Yes. I thought you might want to come with me to take a look. Scully took her first sip of the coffee, and it did indeed taste as awful as she had feared. Well, let's go, Mulder she said, standing up from the table. She handed him back the colorful brochure with its optimistic proclamation. Kennedy must have performed some radical and unorthodox test on his lab animals, she thought. It was possible that after the violent destruction of the facility, and with this possible disease outbreak, some of the animals had escaped, and perhaps they carried something deadly. State Highway 22, Coast Range, Oregon Monday, 10 p.m. The dog stopped in the middle of the road, distracted on his way to the forest. The twin headlights of the approaching car looked like bright coins. The car sounded loud. The car sounded angry. The road was wet and dark. The kids were cranky after a long day of traveling, and at this point, the impromptu vacation didn't seem like such a good idea after all. We should have planned this trip a little better, Sharon said beside him in the front seat. I believed you mentioned that already, Richard answered testily, once or twice. 
In the back seat, Megan and Rory displayed their boredom in uncharacteristic ways. Rory was so restless he had switched off his Game Boy, and Megan was so tired she had stopped picking on her brother. Richard just wanted to find a place to spend the night. Dog! his wife cried. A dog! Watch out! He slammed on the brakes. In the back, the kids screamed. The brakes and tires screamed even louder. The dog tried to leap away at the last instant, but the bumper struck it with a horrible muffled thump. The black lab flew onto the hood, into the windshield, then into the weed-filled ditch. The car screeched to a halt on the road's shoulder. Richard walked around the front of the car with a sick dread. The dog lay sprawled and twitching. A big black Labrador with a smashed skull. The dog wheezed through broken ribs. Blood trickled from its black nose. Christ, why couldn't the thing have just been killed outright? A mercy. Better take him to a doctor, Rory said, startling Richard. Richard, there's a blanket in the back. We'll take the dog to the nearest veterinary clinic. The next town up the road should have one, Sharon said. Swallowing bile, knowing it would do no good, Richard went to get the blanket. Finally, Richard saw an unlit, painted sign, Hewitt's Family Veterinary Clinic and he swerved into the empty parking lot. He vigorously wrapped his knuckles on the window until finally a light flicked on in the foyer. When an old man peered at them through the glass, Richard shouted, We've got a hurt dog in the car. We need your help. Well, we'll see what we can do, the vet said, coming out of the door and going around to the rear of the car. In the back, the dog lay bloody and mangled, somehow still alive. To Richard's surprise, the black lab seemed stronger than before, breathing more evenly deeply asleep. The vet stared at it, and from the masked expression on the old man's face, Richard knew the dog had no hope of surviving. This isn't your dog? the vet asked. No, sir, Richard answered. No tags, either. Megan peered into the back to look. Is he going to be all right, mister? she asked. The vet smiled at her. Oh, of course he'll be all right, he said. I've got some special kinds of bandages. He looked up at Richard. If you could help me carry him in, I'll let you be on your way. Together, the two men reached under the blanket, lifting the heavy dog. Why, well, he's hot, the vet said as they entered the swinging door. Anxious to be away, Richard stepped to the door, thanking the old man profusely. He hurried back to the car and swung himself inside. He'll take care of everything, Richard said to no one in particular, and started the car. The night insects resumed their music in the forest. Mercy Hospital, Portland, Oregon, Tuesday, 10.03 a.m. The center of mourning on a gray day. Typical morning, typical Portland. Scully didn't suppose it made any difference if she and Mulder were going to spend the day in a hospital morgue anyway. Dr. Frank Quentin, Portland's medical examiner, warmly shook Scully's hand and Mulder's. Mulder nodded at his partner, speaking to the coroner. As I mentioned on the phone, sir, Agent Scully is a medical doctor herself, and she has had experience with many unusual deaths. Perhaps she can offer some suggestions. The coroner beamed at her, and Scully couldn't help but smile back at the kind-faced man. What is the status of the body now? We used full disinfectants and have been keeping the body in cold storage to stop the spread of any biological agents, the M.E. said. You've used appropriate quarantine conditions, Scully asked. Quinton looked over at her. Luckily, the police were spooked enough by the appearance of the corpse that they took precautions, gloves, contamination wraps. Everything was burned in the hospital incinerator here. The morgue assistant stopped in front of the stainless steel drawer and peeled away the biohazard sticker. A card on the front panel of the drawer labeled it, Restricted. Police Evidence. Like a showroom model revealing a new sports car, the morgue attendant drew back the sheet. He stood aside proudly to let the medical examiner, Scully, and Mulder push forward. Scully was unable to keep herself from bending over in fascination. She saw the splotches of coagulated blood beneath the guard's skin like blackened bruises, the lumpy, doughy growths that had sprouted like mushrooms inside his tissues. I've never seen tumors that grow so fast, Scully said. The limited rate of cellular reproduction should make such a rapid spread impossible. She bent down and observed a faint, slimy covering on some patches of skin, some kind of clear mucus, like slime. Scully continued to study the body with the practiced eye of a physician, analyzing the symptoms, the patterns, trying to imagine the pathology. The attendant offered her a box of latex gloves. She snapped on a pair, flexing her fingers. Then she reached forward to touch the cadaver's skin. She expected it to be cold and hard with rigor, but instead the body felt warm, 
fresh and flexible. Scully looked again at the cadaver and tried to picture what the mysterious research Dimar did might have produced. If something had gotten loose, they might have to deal with a lot more bodies just like this one. What had Darren Kennessy known or suspected that had led him to run and hide from the research entirely? All right, let's go, Mulder. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Scully dried her hands and brushed her red hair away from her face. We need to find out what Kennessy was working on. Kennessy Residence, Tigard, Oregon, Tuesday, 12.17 p.m. The house looked like most of the others on the street, suburban normal, built in the 70s with aluminum siding, shake shingles, average lawn, average hedges. Nothing to make it stand out among the other middle-class homes in a residential city on the outskirts of Portland. Somehow I expected the home of a hotshot young cancer researcher to be more... impressive, Mulder said. Maybe a white lab coat draped on the mailbox, test tubes lining the front walkway. Researchers aren't that glamorous, Mulder. They don't spend their time playing golf and living in mansions. Besides, she added, the Kennessy family had some rather extraordinary medical expenses beyond what insurance would cover. According to records they had obtained, Jody Kennessy's leukemia and his ever-worsening spiral of the last-ditch treatments had gobbled their savings, forced them into taking a second mortgage. Together, Mulder and Scully walked up the driveway toward the front door. After seeing the guard's body and the gruesome results of the disease that had so rapidly struck him down, Scully knew they had to determine exactly what David Kennessy had been developing at the Dimar Laboratory. The available records had been destroyed in the fire, and Mulder had so far been unable to track down anyone in charge. He couldn't even pinpoint who had overseen Dimar's funding from the federal government. The dead ends and false leads intrigued him, kept him hunting while the medical questions engaged Scully's interest. She wouldn't normally expect the wife of a researcher to necessarily know much about his work, but in this case there were extenuating circumstances. She and Mulder had decided their next step would be to talk to Kennessy's widow, Patrice, an intelligent woman in her own right. In her heart, Scully also wanted to see Jody. As Mulder reached for the doorbell, Scully instantly noticed the shattered latch. Mulder! She bent to inspect the lock. It had been broken in, the wood splintered. She could see dents around the knob and the deadbolt, the torn-up jam. Someone had crudely pressed the fragments back in place, a cosmetic cover-up that would fool casual passerby from the street. Mulder pounded on the door. Hello! he shouted. Scully stepped into the flower bed to peer inside the window. Through a gap in the drape she saw overturned furniture in the main room, scattered debris on the floor. Mulder, we have sufficient cause to enter the premises. He pushed harder and the door swung easily open. Federal agents, he called out. But the Kennessy home answered them only with a quiet, gasping echo of his call. Mulder and Scully stepped into the foyer and both stopped simultaneously to stare at the disaster. Very subtle, Mulder said. The home had been ransacked. Furniture tipped over, upholstery slashed, stuffing pulled out. The baseboards had been pried away from the walls. The carpeting ripped up as the violent searchers dug down to the floorboards. I don't think we're going to find anybody here, Scully said, hands on her hips. Scully walked into the kitchen, mindful of the drinking glasses shattered on the linoleum floor and on the Formica countertop. The searchers couldn't possibly have been looking for anything inside the glass tumblers. They had simply enjoyed the destruction. Mulder bent down next to the refrigerator and looked at an orange plastic dog food bowl. He picked it up, turning it to show the name Vader written in magic marker across the front. Look at this, Scully, he said. If something happened to Patrice and Jody Kennessy, then where's the dog? Scully frowned. Maybe the same place they are. With a long, slow look at the devastation in the kitchen, Scully swallowed hard. Looks like our search just got wider. Coast Range, Oregon, Tuesday, 2.05 p.m. No one would ever find them in this cabin, isolated out in the wilderness of the Oregon coastal mountains. No one would help them. No one would rescue them. Patrice and Jody Kennessy were alone, desperately trying to hold on to some semblance of normal life by the barest edges of their fingernails. She went to the window of the small cabin and parted the dingy drapes to watch Jody bounce a tennis ball against the outside wall. He was in plain view, 
but within running distance of the thick forest that ringed the hollow. Each impact of the tennis ball sounded like gunshots aimed at her. At one time, the isolation of this plot of land had been a valuable asset, back when she had designed the place for her brother-in-law as a place for him to get away from Dimar. This cabin was supposed to be a private vacation hideout for relaxation and solitude. Darren had deliberately refused to put in a phone or a mailbox, and they had promised to keep the location secret. No one was supposed to know about this place. Now the isolation was like a fortress wall around them. No one knew where they were. No one would ever find them out here. Their plight kept Patrice on the verge of terror and paralysis each day. Jody, so brave that it choked her up every time she thought about it, had been through so much already. The pursuit, the attack on Dimar, and so much before that. The doctor's assessment, terminal cancer, leukemia, not long to live. After the original leukemia diagnosis, what greater threat could shadowy conspirators possibly use? What could outweigh the demon inside Jody's own twelve-year-old body? Any other ordeal must pale in comparison. As the tennis ball bounced away from the cabin into the knee-high weeds, Jody chased after it in a vain attempt to amuse himself. Patrice moved to the edge of the window to keep him in view. The boy seemed so much healthier now. Patrice didn't dare to hope for the remission to continue. He should be in the hospital now, but she couldn't take him. She didn't dare. Patrice opened the screen door, and with a glance over her shoulder, she stepped onto the porch, taking care to keep the worried expression off her face, although by now Jody would consider any look of concern normal for her. Jody smacked the tennis ball too hard, and it sailed off to the driveway, struck a stone, and bounced into the thick meadow. With a shout of anger that finally betrayed his tension, Jody hurled his tennis racket after it, then stood fuming. Hey, Jody, she called, quelling most of the scolding tone. He fetched the racket and plodded toward her, his eyes toward the ground. He had been restless and moody all day. What's wrong with you? Jody averted his eyes, turned instead to squint where the sunshine lit the dense pines. Far away, she could hear the deep drone of a heavily laden log truck growling down the highway on the other side of the tree barricade. It's Vader, he finally answered. He didn't come back yesterday, and I haven't seen him all morning. Now Patrice understood, and she felt the relief wash over her. For a moment, she had been afraid he might have seen some stranger, or heard something about them on the radio news. Just wait and see. Your dog will be all right. He always says. Hewitt's Family Veterinary Clinic, Lincoln City, Oregon, Tuesday, one eleven a.m. Dr. Elliot Hewitt was torn between intentionally putting the mangled black Labrador to sleep or just letting it die. As a veterinarian, he had to make the same decision year after year after year, and it never got easier. The dog lay on one of the stainless steel surgical tables, still alive against all odds. The rest of the veterinary clinic was quiet and silent. Outside it was dark, drizzling as it usually did this time of night, but the temperature was warm enough for the vet to prop open the back door. The black lab lay shivering, sniffing, whimpering. Blood smeared the stainless steel table. The dog shivered, but its body temperature burned higher than he had ever felt in an animal before. He inserted a thermometer, genuinely curious, then watched in astonishment as the digital readout climbed from 103 to 104. Normally a dog's temperature should have been 101.5 or 102 at most, and with the shock from his injuries, this dog's body temp should have dropped. The number on the readout climbed to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. He drew a routine blood sample, then checked diligently for any other signs of sickness or disease, some cause for the fever that rose like a furnace from his body. What he found, though, surprised him even more. The black lab's massive injuries almost seemed to be healing rapidly, the wounds shrinking. He lifted one of the bandages he had pressed against a gash on the dog's ribcage. But though the gauze was soaked with blood, he saw no sign of the wound, only matted fur. The dog's body trembled, quietly whimpering. With his calloused thumb, Hewitt lifted one of its squeezed shut eyelids and saw a milky covering across its rolled-up eye, like a partially boiled egg. The dog was in a deep coma, gone. He barely breathed. The temperature reached 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Even without the injuries, this fever was deadly. A ribbon of blood trickled out of the wet black nostrils. Seeing that tiny injury, 
A little flaw of red blood across the black fur of the delicate muzzle made Hewer decide not to put the dog through any more of this. Enough was enough. Dr. Hewitt heaved a heavy sigh as he discarded the used syringe. Sorry, boy, he said. Go chase some rabbits in your dreams. In a place where you don't have to watch out for cars. The chemical would take effect soon, suppressing the dog's respiration and eventually stopping his heart. Irrevocable, but peaceful. First, though, Hewitt took the blood sample back to the small lab area in the adjoining room. The animal's high body temperature puzzled him. He'd never seen a case like this before. Hewitt illuminated the slide under his microscope with a small lamp. Rubbing his eyes first, he gazed down at the smear of blood, fiddling with the focus knob. The dog should even now be drifting off to perpetual dreams, but its blood was absolutely alive. In addition to the usual red and white cells and platelets, Hewitt saw tiny specks, little silvery components little squarish, glittering crystals that moved about on their own. If this was some sort of massive infection, it was not like any microorganism he had ever before laid eyes on. The metallic shapes were as large as the cells and moved about with blurred speed, as if with a mission. That's incredible, he said. In the back surgery room, the caged animals set up a louder racket, yowling and barking. The old man noticed it subconsciously but the noise wasn't enough to tear him from his fascination with what he saw under the microscope. Then he suddenly realized that the barking and meowing inside the operating room cages had become an outright din, as if a fox had charged into a hen house. Hewitt rushed into the operating room and looked at the cages, first to see the captive animals pressed back against the bars of their cages, trying to get away from the center of the room. He didn't even look at the black lab, because it should have been dead by now but then he heard paws skittering across the slick surface of stainless steel. Hewitt stood in total shock, unable to believe that the dog had not only regained consciousness, despite his grievous injuries and the euthanasia drug, but showed no evidence of injury. Here, boy, let me take a look. Quivering, the dog barked at him, then backed away. Under Burnside Bridge, Portland, Oregon, Tuesday, 11.21 p.m. He tried to hide and he tried to sleep, but nothing came to him but a succession of vicious nightmares. Jeremy Dorman did not know whether the dreams were caused by the swarms of microscopic invaders tinkering with his head, with his thought processes, or whether the nightmares came as a result of his guilty conscience. A heavy truck rumbled overhead across the bridge with a sound like a muffled explosion, like the Dimar explosion. That night, the last night, came back to him too vividly. The darkness filled with fire and shouts and explosions. Murderous and destructive people, faceless, nameless, all brought together by someone pulling strings invisibly in the shadows. And they were malicious, destructive. When the actual destruction started, Jeremy recalled seeing David scrambling to grab his records, his samples, like in all those old movies where the mad scientist strives to rescue a single notebook from the flames. David seemed more pissed off than frightened. He kicked a few stray pencils away from his feet and spoke in his let's be reasonable voice. Some boneheaded fanatic is always trying to stop progress, but it never works. Nobody can undiscover this new technology. But Dorman himself knew that some people in the government were certainly intent on trying to do just that. And even with all the prior planning and the hushed agreements, they hadn't given Dorman time to escape, despite their promises. While David was distracted, rushing to the phone to warn his wife about the attack and her own danger, Dorman had not been able to find any of the pure original nanomachines, just the prototypes, questionable samples that had been used, with mixed results, on the other lab animals before their success with the dog. But still, the prototypes had worked, to a certain extent. They had saved him, technically at least. Then Dorman heard windows smashing upstairs, the murderous shouts pouring closer, and he knew it was time. Those prototypes had been his last resort, the only thing he could find. They had been viable enough in the lab rat tests, hadn't they? And the dog was just fine, perfectly healthy. What choice did he have but to take a chance? Still, the possibility froze Dorman with terror, uncertainty, for a moment. If he did this, it would be an irrevocable act. He couldn't just go to the drugstore and get the antidote. But the thought of how those men had betrayed him, how they meant to kill him and tidy up all their problems, 
gave him the determination he needed. After Dorman added the activation hormone and the self-perpetuating carrier fluid, the microscopic machines were supposed to adapt, reset their programming. With a small whoomp, a Molotov cocktail exploded in the lobby, and then came running feet. He heard hushed voices and quiet discussion that sounded cool and professional, a contrast to the chanting and yelling that continued outside. The protests Dorman knew were staged. Quickly, silently, Dorman injected himself just before David Kennessy returned to his side. Now the lead researcher finally looked afraid, and with good reason. Four of the gunshots struck him in the chest, driving him backward into the lab tables. Then the Dimar building erupted into flames, much faster than Jeremy Dorman could have imagined. He tried to escape, but even as he fled, the flames swept along, closing in on him as the walls ignited. The shock wave of another large explosion pummeled him against one of the concrete basement walls. The stairwell became a chute of fire, searing his skin. He had watched it bubble and blacken. Dorman shouted with outrage at the betrayal. Now he awoke screaming under the bridge. The echoes of his outcry vibrated against the river water, ricocheting across the river and up under the bridge. As he swayed to his feet, Dorman looked down at the rock embankment where he had slept so fitfully. There he saw the bodies of five pigeons, wings splayed, feathers ruffled, their eyes glassy gray. Their beaks hung open with a trickle of blood curling down from their tongues. Dorman stared at the dead birds and his stomach clenched, turning a somersault with nausea. He didn't know what his body had done, how he had lost control during his nightmares. Only the pigeons knew. A last gray feather drifted to the ground in silence. Dorman staggered away climbing up toward the road. He had to get out of Portland. He had to find his quarry before it was too late for any of them. Federal Office Building, Crystal City, Virginia, Wednesday, 11.30 a.m. Adam Lentz sat at his government-issued desk and pondered the videotape in front of him. The tape still smelled of smoke from the Dimar fire, and he was anxious to play it. Part of his role in the unnamed government office had been to oversee Dr. David Kennessy's research at Dimar Laboratory. Kennessy had experienced a few crucial lucky breaks, or made shrewd decisions, and Lentz knew Dimar was the most likely site for a breakthrough. Things had gotten out of control, and Kennessy hadn't even seen it coming. Lentz hoped the confiscated tape had not been damaged in the cleansing fire that had obliterated Dimar. His cleanup teams had scoured the wreckage for any evidence, any intact samples or notes, and they had found the hidden fire safe, removed its contents, and brought the tape to him. He popped the tape into the VCR. In the clean and brightly lit lab, the dog paced inside his cage, an enclosure designed for larger animals. Good boy, Vader, David Kennessy said, moving across the camera's field of view. Just sit. Even with all the things he had seen in his life, all the strange corruptions and self-justified horrors, Lentz couldn't believe what Kennessy was about to do to his own family dog. Kennessy adjusted the camera. Beside him near the dog's cage, the big-shouldered technical assistant Jeremy Dorman stood like Igor next to his beloved Frankenstein. Kennessy postured in front of the camera. I've already filled my data, sent my detailed documentation. I'm tired of having my memos disappear in your piles of paper. Considering that this breakthrough will change the universe as we know it, I think somebody might want to give up a coffee break to have a look. Oh, no, Dr. Kennessy. Lentz thought as he watched. Your reports didn't disappear. We paid a great deal of attention. Kennessy glanced at his watch, then over at Dorman. Are you prepared here, Dorman? The big lab assistant rested his hand on the wire cage. The black lab poked his muzzle against Dorman's palm, snuffling. Dorman practically leaped out of his skin. Are you sure we should do this? he asked. Kennessy looked at his assistant with an expression of pure scorn. No, Jeremy. I want to just give up, shelve the work, and let Jody die. Maybe I should retire and become a CPA. Dorman raised both hands in embarrassed surrender. All right, all right, just checking. Vader looked expectantly at his master, then sat down in the middle of his cage. His tail thumped on the floor. Good boy, Kennessy muttered. Jeremy Dorman went out of range, then returned a few moments later, holding a handgun, a clunky but powerful Smith & Wesson. 
He turned to Dorman. Ridley, you may fire when ready. Dorman looked confused as if wondering who Kennessy meant. Then he raised the Smith & Wesson. He pointed the gun at the dog. Vader sensed something was wrong. He backed up as far as he could in the cage, then growled, loud and low. His dark eyes met Dorman's, and he bared his fangs. Dorman fired twice. Both bullets hit the big black dog, and the impact smashed him into the mesh of the cage. One shot had struck Vader's ribcage. Another shattered his spine. Blood flew out from the bullet holes, drenching his fur. Vader yelped and then sat down from the impact. He panted. On the screen, Kennedy turned to the cage, looking down with clinical detachment. After a major trauma like this, the first thing that happens is that the nanocritters shut down all of the dog's pain centers. The nanocritters will place him in a brief recuperative coma. Already the machines are scouring the damaged sites, assessing the necessary repairs, and starting to put him together again. They can link themselves into larger assemblies to make macro repairs. Kennedy knelt down on the floor beside the cage, reached his hand in to pat Vader on the head. His temperature is already rising from the waste heat generated by the furious nanomachines. Look, the blood has stopped flowing. A large-scale physical trauma like this is actually easier to fix than a widespread disease like cancer. The nanomachines have programmed themselves according to the dog's DNA blueprint and will make the needed repairs. A gunshot injury needs a bit of patchwork, cellular bandages, and some reconstruction. With a genetic disease, though, each cell must be repaired, every anomaly tweaked and adjusted. Purging a cancer patient might take weeks or months. These bullet wounds, though. He gestured down at the motionless black lab. Well, Beta will be up chasing squirrels again tomorrow. Within an hour, the dog woke up again, groggy but rapidly recovering. Vader stood up in the cage, shook himself, and barked, healthy, healed, as good as new. Kennessy released him from the cage, and the dog bounded out, starved for attention and praise. Kennessy laughed out loud and ruffled his fur. Lentz watched in astonishment. Understanding now that Kennessy's work was even more frightening, even more successful than he had feared. His people had been absolutely right to take the samples, lock them away, and then destroy all remaining evidence. If something like this became available to the general public, he couldn't conceive of the earth-shattering consequences. No. Everything had to be destroyed. Lentz popped out the videotape and locked it within a repository for classified documents. The fire safe at Dymar had protected this tape, and the other documents with it. But unfortunately, he knew with a grim certainty that they had not recovered every scrap, every sample. Now, after all he had seen, Lentz finally understood the frantic phone call they had tapped when David Kennessy had dialed his home number on the night of the explosive protest, on the night of the fire. Kennessy's voice had been frantic, ragged. He didn't even let his wife speak. Patrice, take Jody and Vader and get out of there. Now! Everything I was afraid of is going down. You have to run. I'm already trapped at Dymar, but you can get away. Keep running. Don't let them get you. After seeing the videotape, Lentz realized a grave mistake he had made. Before he had worried that Patrice might have a few notes, some research information that Lentz needed to retrieve. Now, though, the danger had increased by orders of magnitude. How could he have missed it before? The dog wasn't just a family pet that the Kennessys could bear to leave behind. That black lab was the dog. It was the research animal. It carried the nanomachines inside its bloodstreams, lurking there, just waiting to spread around the world. Lentz swallowed hard and grabbed for the phone. After a moment, though, he froze and gently set the receiver back in the cradle. This was not a mistake he wanted to admit to the man in charge. He would take care of it himself. Everything else had been destroyed in the Dymar fire, but now Adam Lentz had to call in all of his resources, get reinforcements, spend whatever time or money was necessary. He had a woman, a boy, and especially their pet dog to track down. Kennedy's Cabin, Coast Range, Oregon, Wednesday, 1.10 p.m. Jody's sadness over Vader was like an open sore. Sitting at the kitchen table doing a jigsaw puzzle, he continually glanced through the dingy curtains over the main windows, searching the tree line. Suddenly he jumped up. Mom, he's back! Jody shouted, pushing away from his chair. Patrice stood up from the puzzle table, astonished to see the black Labrador bounding out of the trees. 
Jody leaped away from the table and bolted out the door. He ran toward the black dog so hard she expected her son to sprawl on his face on the gravel driveway or trip on a stump or fallen branch in the yard. Dripping and grass-stained, Jody raced Vader back to the cabin. Patrice wiped her hands on a kitchen towel and came out to the porch to greet him. I told you he'd be okay, she said. Idiotically happy, Jody nodded and then stroked the dog. Patrice patted the dog's head, and Vader rolled his deep brown eyes up at her. With a shake of her head, she said, I wish you could tell us stories. Lincoln City, Oregon, Wednesday, 5.01 p.m. As they left Hewitt's veterinary clinic in the sleepy coastal town of Lincoln City, Scully could still hear the barking dogs and distressed animals. On their way to tracking down David Kennessy's survivalist brother, a report from this veterinarian's office to the CDC had caught Mulder's attention. Elliot Hewitt had treated a dog, a black Labrador who was also infected with the same substance as the security guard. Mulder had been intrigued by the coincidence. Now at least they had some place to start looking. Think about it, Scully, his eyes gleamed. If Dimar developed some sort of an amazing regenerative treatment, David might well have tested it on the pet dog. Scully bit her lip. With his son's condition, he would have been desperate enough for just about anything. She slumped into the seat and buckled her seatbelt. Scully looked at the road ahead. We've got to find that dog, Mulder. Without answering, he accelerated the car. Ross Island Bridge, Portland, Oregon, Thursday, 7.18 a.m. The bridge spread out into the early morning fog. Its vaulted and lacy metal girders disappeared into the mist like an infinite tunnel. To Jeremy Dorman, it was just a route across the Willamette River on his long and stumbling trek out of the city, toward the wilderness, toward where he might find Patrice and Jody Kennessy. Dorman swallowed hard. His throat felt slick, as if clogged with slime a mucus that oozed from his pores. When he clenched his teeth, they rattled loosely in their gums. His vision carried a black fringe of static around the edges. He walked onward. He had no other alternative. Suddenly Dorman's stomach clenched, his spine whipped about like an angry serpent. He feared he would disintegrate here, slough off into a pool of dissociated flesh and twitching muscles, a gelatinous mass that would drip down beneath the graded walkway of the bridge. No! he cried a howling in human voice in the stillness. Dorman reached out with one of his slick, waxy hands and grabbed the bridge railing to support himself, willing his body to cease its convulsions. He was losing control again. He couldn't go to a hospital or seek other medical attention. No doctor in the world would know how to treat his affliction. And any time he reported his name, he might draw the attention of... unwanted eyes. He couldn't risk that. He would have to endure the pain for now. Finally, when the spasm passed and he felt weak and trembly, Dorman set off again. His body wouldn't fall apart on him yet. Not yet. But he needed to focus. He needed to reestablish the goal in his mind. He had to find the damn dog. Oregon Coast, Thursday, 12.25 p.m. Mulder drove slowly, glancing from side to side. Someone had bothered to put up an unbroken barbed wire fence from which no trespassing signs dangled at frequent intervals. Out of the corner of his eye, Mulder saw a black shape moving, an animal loping along. He squinted at it intently, then hit the brakes. Look, Scully! He pointed, sure of what he saw in the trees behind the barbed wire fence. A black dog about the right size to be the missing pet. Let's go check it out. Maybe it's Vader. He swung the car onto the narrow gravel shoulder, then hopped out. Scully exited into the ditch, trying to maintain her footing. Mulder sprinted to the barbed wire, pushing down on the rusted strands and ducking through. He turned to hold one of the wires up for Scully. Off in the trees, the dog looked at them before trotting nervously away. Here, boy! Mulder called, then tried whistling. He ran crashing after it through the underbrush. The dog barked and turned and bolted. Scully chased after him. That's not the way to get a skittish dog to come back to you, she said. Mulder paused to listen, and the dog barked again. Come on, Scully. Along the trees, even this deep in the woods, he saw frequent no trespassing signs, along with private property warning. Violators will be prosecuted. Several of the signs were peppered with buckshot dents. 
Finally, as Mulder continued up the slope after the black dog, ducking between trees and wheezing from lack of breath, he reached the crest of the hill. A line of danger signs marked the area. As Scully came close to him, flushed from the pursuit, they topped the rise. Uh-oh, Mulder. Suddenly dozens and dozens of dogs began barking and baying. She saw a chain-link fence topped with razor wire, surrounding an entire compound of half-buried houses, bunkers, prefabricated cabins, and guard shacks. The black dog raced toward the compound. Mulder and Scully skidded to a stop, and the soft forest dirt as armed men rushed from the guard shacks at the corners of the compound. Other people stepped out of the cabins. Women peered through the windows, grabbing their children and protecting them from what they thought must be an unexpected government raid. The men shouted and raised their rifles, firing warning shots into the air. Mulder instantly held up his hands. Other dogs came bounding out of the compound, German shepherds, Rottweilers, and Doberman pinchers. Mulder, I think we found the survivalists you were looking for, Scully said. Survivalist Compound, Thursday, 1.09 p.m. We're federal agents, Mulder announced. I'm going to reach for my identification. With agonizing slowness, he groped inside his topcoat. Unfortunately, all the weapons remained leveled at him, if possible with even greater ire. He realized that radical survivalists probably wanted nothing to do with any government agency. One middle-aged man with an exceedingly long beard stepped forward to the fence and glowered at them. And do federal agents know how to read? he said in a firm, intelligent voice. You've passed dozens, no trespassing signs to get here. Do you have a duly authorized search warrant? I'm sorry, sir, Scully said. We were trying to stop your dog, the black one. We're searching for a man named Darren Kennessy. We have reason to believe he may have information on these people. She reached inside her jacket and withdrew the photos. A woman and her boy. Go get Darren, a woman holding a shotgun yelled over her shoulder. A lean man with bushy cinnamon red hair climbed up the underground stairs of one of the half-buried shacks. Uncertainly, he came closer, approaching the bearded man and the angry-looking woman. I'm Darren Kennessy, David's brother. What is it you want? Shouting across the fence, Mulder and Scully briefly explained the situation, and Darren Kennessy looked exceedingly disturbed. You suspected something beforehand, didn't you? Before Dimar was destroyed and your brother killed, Mulder asked. You left your research many months ago and came out here. To hide. Darren became indignant. I left my research for philosophical reasons. I thought the technology was turning in a very alarming direction, and I did not like some of the funding sources my brother was using. I wanted to separate myself from the work and the men associated with it. Cut loose entirely. Just suppose one of our first nanomachines, a simple one, without fail-safe programming, happens to escape from the lab, Darren said. If this one goes about copying itself, and each copy builds more copies, in about ten hours there would be sixty-eight billion nanomachines. In less than two days, the runaway nanomachines could take apart the entire Earth, working one molecule at a time. Two days, from the beginning to end. Think of the last time you saw any government make a decision that fast, even in an emergency. No wonder Kennedy's research was so threatening to people in well-established circles of power, Mulder realized. No wonder they might be trying to suppress it, at all costs. But you left Dimar before you reached a point where you could release your findings? Scully asked. Nobody was ever going to release our findings, Darren said, his voice dripping with scorn. I knew it would never be made available to society. David made noises about going public, releasing the results of our first tests with lab rats and small animals... But I always talked him out of it, and so did our assistant, Jeremy Dorman. He drew a deep breath. I guess he must have come too close if those people felt they finally had to burn down the lab facility and destroy all our records. So, Patrice and Jody aren't with you, Scully said, confirming her suspicions. Do you know how we can speak with them? Darren snorted. No, we went our separate ways. I haven't spoken to any of them since I came out here to join the camp. He gestured to the dogs, the guard shacks, the razor wire. This wouldn't be scenic enough for them. But you were Jody's uncle, Mulder said. Didn't you even send him a birthday card? The only person that kid spent time with was Jeremy Dorman. He was the closest thing to a real uncle the boy had. Dorman? I believe he was also killed in the Dimar fire, 
Scully said. Not surprising, Darren Kennessy said. He was a really low man on the totem pole, but he knew how to pull the business deals. He got us our initial funding and kept it coming. When I left to come out here, I think he was perfectly happy to step into my shoes working with David. Darren frowned. But I had nothing more to do with them. Not then, and not now. He seemed deeply troubled as if the news of his brother's death was just now breaking through his consciousness. We used to be... close. I used to spend time out in the deep woods. Patrice even designed a little cabin for me, just to get away from it all. I wonder if she still remembers about it. Scully looked at Mulder, then at Darren. Sir, do you think there is a chance Patrice might have taken Jody there? Could you tell us how we could locate the cabin? Darren frowned again, looking skittish and uneasy. She might have remembered the place. It's up near... Colvain, off on some winding fire roads. Here's my card, Mulder said, in case they do show up or you learn anything. Darren frowned at him. We don't have any phones out here. Scully grabbed Mulder's sleeve. Thank you for your time. They made their way back through the thick woods, past the dozens of warning signs, to where they had parked their car at the edge of the road. Scully couldn't believe how the survivalists lived. Some people will do anything to survive, she muttered. Tillamook County, Coast Range, Oregon, Friday, 10.47 a.m. The cold rain sheeted down, drenching him and the roadside and everything all around. But Jeremy Dorman's other problems were far worse than a bit of lousy weather. The external world was all bad data to him now, irrelevant numbness. The forest of nerves inside him provided enough pain for a world all its own. He shambled past a small county way station, a little shack with a gate and a red stoplight for trucks. Opaque mini-blinds covered the windows, and a sign that looked as if it hadn't been changed in months said, Way Station Closed. He picked up his pace, so focused on keeping himself moving forward that he didn't even hear the loud hum of the approaching truck. The vehicle grew louder, a large log truck half-loaded with pine logs whose bark had been splintered off, and most of the large protruding branches amputated. Dorman turned and looked at it, then stepped farther to the side of the road. The driver flashed his headlights. Dorman heard the engine growl as the trucker shifted down through the gears, and the air brakes sigh as he finally brought the log truck to a halt thirty feet in front of Dorman. He just stood and stared, unable to believe what had happened, what a stroke of luck. This man was going to give him a ride. Dorman hurried forward, squelching water from his shoes. He huddled his arms around his chest. The driver leaned over the seat and popped open the passenger door. Dorman grabbed the door handle and swung it open. His leg jittered as he lifted it to step on the running board. Finally, he gained his balance and hauled himself up. He was dripping, exhausted, cold. Boy, you look miserable, the truck driver said. He was short and poorly, with dirty blonde hair and blue eyes. I am miserable, Dorman answered, surprised that his own voice worked so well. Well, then, be miserable inside the truck cab here. You got a place to go, or just wandering? I've got a place to go, Dorman said. I'm just trying to get there. Well, you can ride with me until the coast highway turn off. My name's Wayne. Wayne Hackaway. The trucker wrestled with the stick shift and rammed the vehicle into gear again. With a groan and a labor of its engines, the log truck began to move forward along the wet road uphill toward the trees. Dorman sat back, pressed against the door of the truck, trying to ignore the guilt and fear he felt. He didn't dare let the man touch him. He couldn't risk the exposure another body would bring. After fifteen minutes of Dorman's trance-like silence, the trucker began to glance at him sidelong, as if wondering what kind of psychopath he had foolishly picked up. Dorman avoided his gaze staring out the side window. And then his gut spasmed. He hunched over and clenched his hands to his stomach. He hissed breath through his teeth. He felt something jerk beneath his skin like a mole burrowing through his ribcage. Hey, are you all right? The trucker said. Yes. Dorman answered, ripping the answer out of his voice box. He squeezed hard enough until he could finally regain control over his rebellious biological systems. He sucked in deep, pounding breaths. Finally, the convulsions settled down again. 
Wayne Hikeaway glanced at him again, then turned back to concentrate on the wet road. He kept both hands gripped white on the steering wheel. Dorman remained seated in silence, huddled against the hard comfort of the passenger side door. A bit of slime began to pool on the seat around him. He knew he could lose control again at any moment. Every hour, it got harder and harder. Max's General Store and Art Gallery, Colvane, Oregon, Friday, 12.01 p.m. Scully was already tired of driving and glad for the chance to stop and ask a few more people if they recognized Patrice and Jody Kennessy. I can't find this town on the map, Mulder said. Colvane, Oregon. Scully parked in front of a quaint old shake shingle house with a hand-painted sign dangling on a chain on a post out front. Max's General Store and Art Gallery. Mulder, we're in the town, and I can't find it. The heavy wooden door of the general store advertised Morley cigarettes. A bell on the top jingled as they entered the creaking hardwood floor of Max's. Of course they'd have a bell, Mulder said, looking up. Behind the cash register, an old woman sat barricaded by newspaper racks and wire trays that held gum, candy, and breath mints. May I help you folks? You need maps or sodas? Mulder flashed his badge and ID. We're federal agents, ma'am. We're wondering if you could give us directions to a cabin near here, some property owned by a Mr. Darren Kennessy. We're looking for these two people, Scully said, putting the photos of the Kennessys down on the counter. The woman removed her glasses and wiped them off with a Kleenex, then put them on her face again. Yes, I, I think I've seen these two before, the woman at least. Been out here a week or two. Mulder perked up. Yes, that's about the time frame we're talking about. Could you give us directions, ma'am? Scully asked, then held her breath in anticipation. The red-headed woman withdrew a pen, but didn't bother to write down directions. About seven or eight miles back, you turn on a little road called Locust Springs Drive. Go about a quarter of a mile, then turn left on a logging road. It's the third driveway on your right. She toyed with her strand of fake pearls. The place has been empty for a long time. This is the best lead we've got so far, Scully said softly, looking eagerly at her partner. The thought of rescuing Jody Kennessy. Helping him out in his weakened state gave her new energy. As an FBI agent, Scully was supposed to maintain her objectivity and not get emotionally involved in a case lest her judgment be influenced by it. In this instance, she couldn't help it. She and Jody Kennessy both shared the shadow of cancer, and the connection to this boy she'd never met was too strong. Her desire to help him was far more powerful than Scully had anticipated when she and Mulder had left Washington to investigate the Dymar fire. The bell on the door jingled again, and a state policeman strode in, his boots heavy on the worn wooden floor of the general store. Scully looked over her shoulders as the trooper walked casually over to the soft drink cooler and grabbed a large bottle of orange soda. The usual, Jared? The woman called from the cash register, already ringing him up. Would I ever change, Maxie? He answered, and she tossed him a pack of artificially colored cheese crackers from the snack rack. The policeman nodded politely to Mulder and Scully, and noticed the photographs as well as Mulder's badge wallet. Can I help you folks? We're federal agents, sir, Scully said. She picked up the photographs to show him and asked for his assistance. Perhaps he could escort them out to the isolated cabin where Patrice or Jody might be held captive. But suddenly the radio at Jared's hip squelched. A dispatcher's voice came over, sounding alarmed, but brisk and professional. Jared, come in, please. We've got an emergency situation here. A passing motorist found a dead body up the highway about three-quarters of a mile past Doyle's property. The trooper grabbed his radio. Officer Penwick here, he said. What do you mean by a dead body? What condition? A trucker, the dispatcher answered. His logging rig is half off the road. The guy sprawled by the steering wheel and... Well, it's, it's weird, not like any accident injuries I've ever seen. Mulder quickly looked at Scully, intrigued. You go ahead, Scully. I can ride out to the location of the body with Officer uh, Penwick here and, and take a look around. If it's nothing, I'll have him take me to the cabin and meet up with you. Uneasy about being separated from him, but realizing that they had to investigate both possibilities without delay, she nodded. Make sure you take appropriate precautions when investigating the body. I will, Scully. Mulder hurried for the door. The bell jangled as the trooper left, clutching his cheese crackers and orange soda in one hand as he sent off an acknowledgment in his walkie-talkie. He glanced over his shoulder. 
Put it on my tab, Maxie. I'll catch you later. Scully hurried behind them, letting the jingling door swing shut. Mulder and the trooper raced for his police vehicle parked a slant in front of the general store. Mulder called back to her. Just see if you can find them, Scully. Learn what you can. I'll contact you on the cell phone. She returned to their rental car, grabbing her keys. When she glanced down at the unit on the car seat, she finally noticed to her dismay that her cellular phone wasn't working. They were out of range. Kennessy's Cabin, Coast Range, Oregon, Friday, 12.58 p.m. Outside the cabin, Vader barked. He stood up on the porch and paced, letting a low growl loose in his throat. Patrice stiffened. This was a bark of warning. She had been expecting something like this, dreading it. What is it, Mom? Jody asked. From the drawn expression on his face, she could tell he felt the fear as much as she did. In the past week, she had trained him well enough. Someone's coming, she said. Forcing bravery upon herself, she doused the lights inside the cabin, then swung open the front door to stand guard on the porch. They had run here, gone to ground, without preparation. She had to count on their hiding place, since she had no gun, no other weapons. Vader looked over his shoulder at her, then turned toward the driveway again. Jody crowded next to her, trying to see, but she pushed him back inside. Mom! he said indignantly, but she pointed a scolding finger at him, her face hard. He backed away quickly. A figure appeared in the trees, approaching on foot down the long driveway, bordered by dark pines, coming closer, intent on the cabin. Patrice didn't have time to run. Who is it, Mom? Jody asked. Can you see? They had made a plan for such a situation that they would both try to slip away unnoticed and vanish in the trees, hiding out in the wooded hills. Jody knew the surrounding forest well enough. But this intruder had taken them by surprise. He had come on foot, and now neither of them had time to run. Jody, you stay there. Take Vader, go to the back door, and hide. Be ready to run into the trees if you have to, but right now, it'll be a tip-off. He blinked at her in alarm. But I can't leave you behind, Mom. If I buy you some time, then you can get a head start. If they don't mean any harm, then you don't have anything to worry about. Her face turned to stone, and Jody flushed as he realized what she meant. She turned back to the door, squinting her eyes. Now keep yourself out of sight. Wait until the timing's right. With a grim expression on her face, Patrice crossed her arms over her chest and waited on her front porch to meet the approaching stranger. The terror and urgency nearly paralyzed her. This was the moment of confrontation she had dreaded ever since receiving David's desperate phone call. Even from a distance, Patrice could see his dark gaze turned toward her, his eyes locked with hers. He had changed. His facial features distorted somehow, but she recognized him. Jeremy, she said with a cold breath. Jeremy Dorman. Kennessy Cabin, Oregon Coast Range, Friday, 1.14 p.m. Patrice, Dorman called in a hoarse voice, then walked toward her at an accelerated, somehow ominous pace. Jeremy, are those men after you, too? How did you get away? The fact that somehow Jeremy had escaped gave her a flash of hope that perhaps David might have survived as well, but she could not grasp the thought. It slipped through her mental fingers. She had a thousand questions for him, but most of all she was glad just to see a friend, someone facing the same predicament as she was. She was suddenly wary. Were you followed? If they came after us here, we don't have any weapons. Patrice, he interrupted her. I'm desperate. Please, help me. He swallowed hard, and his throat continued to move far longer than it needed to. I need to come inside. I have a lot to explain, but not much time. Look at me. I have to shape my men. It's very important. Do you have the dog here as well? I need some answers first, she said, not moving from the porch. He stopped in his tracks, uncertain. How did you survive the fire at Dimar? We thought you were dead. Dorman's dark, hooded eyes bored into her. I was betrayed. Just like David was. He took two steps closer. What are you saying? After what she had been through, Patrice thought almost anything might sound believable by now. Dorman nodded. 
They had orders to make sure nothing would survive. No record of our nanotechnology research, only ashes. Dorman lurched to a halt ten feet from the porch, stopping in the weeds of the meadow. They're all after you now, too, Patrice. We can help each other, but I need Vader. He carries the stable prototypes in his bloodstream. Prototypes? What are you talking about? The nanotechnology prototypes. I had to use some of the defective earlier generations, samples from the small lab animals, but many of those exhibited shocking anomalies. I didn't have any choice, though. The lab was on fire. Everything was burning. I was supposed to be able to get away, but this was the only way I could survive. He looked at her, pleading, then lowered his voice. But they didn't work the way they were supposed to. With Vader's blood, there is a chance I can reprogram them and myself. Her mind reeled. She knew what David had been working on. Had suspected something wrong with the black lab. Where's Jody? Dorman said, peering past her to see through the curtains or the half-closed door. Hey, Jody! Come out here, it's all right! Jody had always looked at Dorman as a friend of his father's, a surrogate uncle, especially after Darren had left. Before Patrice could collect her thoughts, understand exactly where the situation stood, Jody pulled open the cabin door, accompanied by his black lab dog. Jeremy! Dorman looked down at Vader, delighted and relieved, but the dog curled back his dark lips to expose fangs. The low growl sounded like a chainsaw embedded in the dog's throat, as if Vader had some kind of grudge against Dorman. But Dorman paid no attention. He was staring at Jody, healthy Jody, in amazement. The skin on Dorman's face blurred and shifted. He winced, somehow forcing it back into place. Jody, you're... you're recovered from the cancer. It's a miracle, Patrice said stiffly. Some kind of spontaneous remission. The sudden predatory expression on Dorman's oddly glistening face made a knot in her stomach. No, it's not a spontaneous remission. Is it, Jody? My God, you have it, too. The boy paled, took a step backward. I know what your dad did to you. For some odd reason, Dorman kept his eyes fixed upon Jody and the dog. Patrice looked at Jody in confusion. Then an instant of dawning horror as she realized the magnitude of what David had done, the risk he had taken, the real reason why his brother had been so frightened of the research. Jody's recent good health was not the result of another remission. All of David's hard work and manic commitment had paid off after all. He had found his cure for cancer without telling Patrice. But in the space of an indrawn breath, her incredible joy and relief and lingering heartbreak was tempered with fear of Jeremy Dorman. Fear of his predatory glances at Jody, of his unnaturally shifting features, his slipping control. This is even better than Vader. Dorman's dark eyes blazed, taking on a distorted look. I just need a sample of your son's blood. Some of his blood, not much. Shocked and confused, Patrice flinched, but stood defiantly on the porch, not moving. She wasn't going to let anyone touch her son. His blood? What on earth? I don't have time to explain to you, Patrice. I didn't know they meant to kill David. They were staging the protest. They meant to burn the place down, but they were going to move the research to a more isolated establishment. His face contorted with anger. I was supposed to be their lead researcher in the new facility, but they tried to murder me, too. Patrice's mind reeled. Her perception of reality was being assaulted from too many directions at once. You knew all along they intended to burn the place down? You were part of the conspiracy? No, I didn't mean that. It was all supposed to be under control. They lied to me, too. You let David be killed, you bastard. You wanted the credit. You wanted his research. Patrice. Jody. I'll die without your help. Right now. Dorman strode toward the porch with great speed, but Patrice moved to block his path. Jody, get back in the cabin. Right now. We can't trust him. He killed your father. Her voice was ice cold and the boy was already frightened. He quickly moved to do as she asked. 
Dorman stopped five feet away, glowering at her. Don't do this. You don't understand. I know I've got to protect my son after all he's been through. You're probably still working for those men hunting us. I'm not letting you near him. She held her fists at her side, ready to tear this man apart with her bare hands. Jody, go out and hide in the forest. You know where to go, just like we planned before, she shouted into the gap of the half-open door. Go! Something squirmed beneath Norman's chest. He hunched over, covering his stomach and his ribs. Finally, he rose up with his eyes glassy and pain-stricken. I can't wait any longer, Patrice. He swayed in his step, coming closer. In the back of the cabin, the rear door banged shut. Jody had run outside, making a beeline for the forest. Inside, she thanked her son for not arguing. She had feared he would side with Jeremy and want to help the man. Vader bounded around the side of the cabin after Jody, barking. Dismissing Patrice, Dorman turned toward the back. Jody! Come here to me, boy! He trudged away from the porch over to the side of the cabin. Patrice felt an animal scream build within her throat. You leave my boy alone! Dorman spun about and withdrew a revolver from his pants pocket. He gripped it with unsteady hands, holding it in front of her disbelieving gaze. You don't know what you're doing, Patrice, he said. You don't know anything about what's going on. I can just shoot the dog, or Jody, and get the blood I need. Maybe that would be easiest after all. His muscle control was sporadic, though, and he could not keep a steady beat on her. Patrice could not believe he would shoot her anyway. Not Jeremy Dorman. With an outcry, she vaulted over the porch railing, throwing herself in a battering ram tackle toward Dorman. As he saw her charging him, he flinched backward with a look of horror on his face. No! Don't touch me! Then she plowed into him, knocking his gun away and driving the man to the ground. Jody, run! Keep running! she screamed. Dorman thrashed and writhed, trying to kick her away. No, Patrice, stay away! Stay away from me! But she fought with him, clawing, pummeling. His skin was slick and slimy. Without a word, Jody and the dog raced into the forest. Kennessy's Cabin, Coast Range, Oregon, Friday, 1.26 p.m. The dense trees clawed at him. Their branches scratched his face, tugged his hair, grabbed his shirt. But Jody kept sprinting anyway. The last words he heard were his mother's desperate shout, Jody, run! Keep running! Vines grabbed at the toes of his shoes, but Jody kept stumbling along. Jody, wait! It was Jeremy Dorman's voice, but it carried a strange and strangled undertone. Hey, Jody! It's okay! I'm not gonna hurt you! Jody hesitated, then kept pushing ahead. Vader barked loudly and dashed under another fallen tree, then bounded up a rocky slope. Jody scrambled after him. He heard Dorman lumbering through the trees, crashing branches aside, alarmingly close. How could the man have moved so fast? Your mother wants to see you! She's back at the cabin! Jody hurried down a slope into a small gully where a stream trickled over rocks and fallen branches. Then he saw the heavy form of Jeremy Dorman in his tattered shirt. Their eyes met from across the great distance in the shadowy forest. Seeing a complete stranger behind Jeremy's eyes, Jody ran with redoubled effort. His heart pounded, and his breath came in great gasps. He dove through clawing bushes that held him back. Behind him, Dorman had no difficulty charging through the underbrush. Jody scrambled up a slope, slipping on loose wet leaves. He knew he couldn't keep up this incredible effort for long. Dorman didn't seem to be slowing at all. He ran to a small gully, thick with deadfall, and lichen-mottled sandstone outcroppings and hid. Dorman came closer, pushing shrubs away, looking through the forest murk. Jody sat in tense silence. In the distance, Vader barked, and Dorman paused, then turned, too, in a different direction. Jody saw his chance and attempted to slip away, but as he moved one of the fallen branches aside, a precariously balanced log crunched down into the brittle deadwood. Dorman froze again and then came charging toward Jody's hiding place. The boy ducked down under the fallen trunk again, scuttled along next to the slick rock, and wormed his way out to the other side of the gully. He stood up and raced off again, keeping his head low, pushing branches out of the way as Dorman yelled at him, fighting through the front of the thicket. Jody risked a glance over his shoulder to see how close his pursuer had come. 
Dorman reached up with a meaty hand pointing toward him. Jody recognized a handgun at the same moment he saw a blaze of light flare from his muzzle. A loud crack echoed through the forest. A chunk of splintered bark and wood exploded away from the pine tree only two feet above his head. Dorman had shot at him. Come here! Right now, damn it! Dorman yelled. Biting back an outcry, Jody scrambled away into the thick underbrush behind the tree that had protected him. Back behind him, Dorman sloshed across the cold stream, not even trying to use the stepping stones. Jody! Come here! Jody fled desperately toward the sound of the barking dog, and he hoped safety. Rural Oregon, Friday, 1.03 p.m. The logging truck sat half off the road in a shallow ditch, its cab tilted at an odd angle like a metallic behemoth with a broken back. As they drove up in the police cruiser, Mulder could tell instantly that something was wrong with the scene, something more than a standard traffic accident. A red Ford pickup sat parked on the shoulder beside the logging truck. A man with a plastic rain poncho climbed out of the driver's side as Officer Jared Penwick pulled to a halt. The man in the pickup truck waited beside his vehicle, hunched over in the plastic slicker as the trooper crunched toward him. Mulder followed, pulling his top coat closed to keep himself warm. You didn't touch anything in there, did you, Dominic? Jared said. Well, I'm not going near that thing, the man in the pickup answered with a suspicious glance at Mulder. That guy in there is gross. This is Agent Mulder of the FBI, Jared said. Mulder left Jared to stand with the pickup owner as he went over to the logging truck. He held the driver's side door handle and cautiously raised himself up by stepping on the running board. Inside the cab, the driver of the truck sprawled back with his arms akimbo. His legs jammed up and his knees wedged behind the steering wheel like a cockroach that had been sprayed with an exterminator's poison. The pudgy man's face was contorted and swollen with lumps, his jaw slack. The whites of his eyes were gray and smoky, laced with red lines of worse than bloodshot veins. Purplish black blotches stood out like leopard spots all over his skin, as if a miniaturized bombing raid had taken place in his vascular system. The truck window was tightly rolled up. The rain continued to trickle off the slanted roof of the cab and down the passenger side window. From inside, the windshield was fogged in some places. Mulder thought he saw a faint steam rising from the body. Still balanced on the running board, he turned back to the state trooper, who stood looking at him curiously. Can you run the plates and registration? Mulder asked. See if you can find out who this guy was and where he might have been going. It made Mulder very uneasy to see another hideous death so close to the possible location of Patrice and Jody Kennessy, so close to where Scully had gone to look for them. No one should handle the body until we can get some more help out here, Mulder said briskly. The medical examiner in Portland has dealt with this before. He should probably be called in since he'll know how to handle this. The trooper hesitated as if he wanted to ask a dozen more questions, but instead he trotted back to talk in his radio. Mulder carefully opened the heavy passenger side door and the metal swung out with a groan of hinges. He stepped back to peer inside. The dead trucker looked even more bent and twisted from this perspective. Condensed steam had formed a halo across the windshield and the driver's side door. The body hadn't been here for long, despite its horrible condition. The passenger seat interested Mulder the most, though. He saw threads and tatters of cloth from a shirt that had been split or torn. Runnels of a strange, translucent, sticky substance clung to the fabric of the seat. A kind of congealed slime similar to what Mulder had seen on the dead security guard. He swallowed hard, not wanting to get any closer, careful not to touch anything. This was indeed the same thing they had countered before at the Dimar lab. Mulder was sure this strange toxin, this lethal agent, was the result of Kennedy's renegade work. Mulder saw a square of something like paper lying in the footwell beneath the passenger seat. At first he thought it was a candy wrapper or some kind of label but then he realized it was a photograph, bent and half-hidden in the shadow of the seat. He used the pen to flip over the photograph. It was a picture Mulder had not seen before, but he certainly recognized the faces of the woman and the young boy. He had seen them often enough in the past few days, had shown other photos to hundreds of people in their search for Patrice and Jody. That meant whoever had been a passenger here in the truck, whoever had carried the nanotech plague, was also on his way, also connected to the woman and her son headed to the same place Scully had gone. Mulder stepped away from the truck, wet and cold, feeling a deeper tension now. There's a truck way station a few miles back on this road. It's rarely open, but they have highway patrol surveillance cameras that operate automatically. 
I had somebody run them back a few hours to see if we could grab an image of this truck passing, Officer Penwick smiled, and Mulder nodded at the man's good thinking. That way we can at least establish a solid time frame. Did you find anything? Mulder asked. The trooper smiled. Two images. One we got the log truck barreling past, and a man walking past. Very little traffic on the road. Can we get a video grab? Mulder said eagerly, sliding into the front seat of the patrol car, looking down at the small screen mounted below the dash for their crime computer link-ups. I thought you might want that, Penwick said, fiddling with the keypad. I just had it up here. Ah, there we go. The first image showed the log truck heading down the road, obviously the same vehicle now stalled in the ditch. But Mulder was more interested in something else. Let me see the hitchhiker, the other man. The new image was somewhat blurry, but showed a man walking on the muddy shoulder. Mulder had seen enough, though. He had looked at the file pictures, the Dimar background dossiers, the photos of the two researchers supposedly killed in the devastating fire. It was Jeremy Dorman, David Kennessy's assistant. He was still alive. He slid out of the front of the patrol car, looking urgently at the trooper. Officer Penwick, you have to stay here and protect the scene. This is a highly hazardous place. Do not let anyone go near the body or even inside the cab of the truck without proper decontamination equipment. Sure, Agent Mulder, the trooper said. But where will you be? Mulder turned toward Dominic. Sir, I'm a federal agent. I need the use of your vehicle. Before Dominic could argue with him, Mulder opened the door of the Ford pickup and extended his left hand. The keys, please. The pickup driver frowned, as if this hadn't been the part that concerned him at all. Mulder slammed the door and the old engine started with a comforting roar. He wrestled with a stick shift, trying to remember how to apply the clutch and nudge the gas pedal. And you take good care of my truck, Dominic yelled. I don't want to waste time messing with insurance companies. Mulder rolled down the window and called back. I work for the government. You can trust me. Mulder pushed down hard on the accelerator, hoping he would reach Scully in time. Kennessy's Cabin, Coast Range, Oregon. Friday, 1.45 p.m. Scully got disoriented on the winding dirt logging roads, but finally found the driveway. The car bounced through mud puddles and over bumps. Ahead of her, in a cleared meadow surrounded on all sides by dense trees, sat a single isolated cabin. This modest, rugged home seemed even more out of the way and invisible than the survivalist outpost she and Mulder had visited the day before. She eased the car to a stop in front of the cabin and waited for a few moments. This was a dangerous situation. She was approaching alone with no backup. She had no way of knowing whether Patrice and Jody were hiding voluntarily or if someone held them hostage here, someone with weapons. As Scully stepped out of the car, her head pounded. Hello? Anybody there? Scully called, speaking loudly enough to be heard by anyone inside the house. She took two steps away from the car. The cabin seemed like a haunted house. Its windows were dark, some covered with drapes. Nothing stirred inside. She heard no sounds from within, but the door was ajar. Beside the door, she saw a fresh gouge in the wood siding, pale splinters, the mark from a small caliber bullet. Scully stepped up onto the slick wooden porch. Anybody home? She said again. I'm a federal agent. As she hesitated in front of the door, though, Scully looked to her left and spotted a figure in the tall grass beside the cabin, a human figure lying still. Scully froze all senses alert, then approached to the edge of the porch, peering over the railing. It was a woman sprawled on her chest in the tall grass. She recognized Patrice Kennessy, with strawberry blonde hair and narrow features, but the resemblance ended there. Now she lay twisted in the meadow, her head turned toward Scully, and her expression grim and desperate, even in death. Her skin was blotched with numerous hemorrhages from subcutaneous damage distorted with wild growths in all shapes and sizes. Her eyes were squeezed shut, and Scully saw tiny maps of blood on the lids. Her hands were outstretched like claws as if she had died while fighting tooth and nail against something horrible. Scully stood stricken. She had arrived too late. She stood up, knowing not to approach or touch the possibly contagious body. Patrice was already dead. Now the only thing that remained was to find Jody and keep him safe unless something had already happened to him. She listened to the wind whispering through the tall pines, a shushing sound as needles scraped against each other. Then she heard a dog bark off in the forest, a sharp, excited sound, 
and a moment later came the distinctive crack of a gunshot. Come here right now, damn it! She heard the words, a voice flattened by distance, made gruff with a threat. Jody, come here! Scully drew her handgun and advanced toward the forest, following the sound of voices. Jody was still out here, running for his life, and a man who must have carried the plague, the man who had exposed Patrice Kennessy, was now after the boy. Scully had to catch him first. She ran toward the forest. Kennessy's Cabin, Coast Range, Oregon. Friday, 1.59 p.m. Jody circled through the trees in a long arc, looping around the meadow and approaching from the rear. Vader continued to bark in the trees, sometimes running close to Jody and then bounding off, as if ready to hunt or play. Jody wondered if the Black Lab thought it was all some kind of game. From above, Jody could see the small building in the meadow ahead. He'd come farther than he had thought, but now he could see another car in the driveway, a strange vehicle. He felt a rush of cold fear. Someone else had tracked him down, one of those others his mother had warned him about. Even if he succeeded in outsmarting Jeremy Dorman and escaping back to the cabin, would others be waiting there for him? But right now, his greatest fear was much closer at hand. Dorman continued to charge after him like a truck, plowing through the trees and underbrush, closing the gap. Jody couldn't believe how fast the broad-shouldered man was moving, especially because even to his inexperienced eyes, the big lab assistant did not look at all healthy. Jody, please! I won't hurt you if you just let me talk to you for a second. Jody didn't waste his breath answering. He ran back, arrowing toward the cabin, but abruptly came to a steep slope where a mudslide had sheared off the gentle hillside. Two enormous trees had uprooted, tumbling down and leaving a gash in the dirt like an open wound. Jody didn't have time to go around. Dorman was approaching too fast, rushing along the hillside, holding onto trees and pulling himself along. The slope looked too steep. He couldn't possibly get down it. He heard the dog bark again and saw halfway to the bottom, off to the left of the mudslide, Vader stood with his paws spread, his fur tangled with cockleburrs and weeds. He barked up at his boy. With no other choice, Jody decided to follow. He eased himself over the lip of the mudslide and started to descend, using his hands, digging his fingers into the cold ground, stepping on loose rocks and looking for support. He heard twigs snapping, branches crashing aside as Dorman came closer. Jody tried to move faster. He looked up and glimpsed the burly figure at the upper edge of the hillside. He gasped, and his hand slipped. Jody's foot stepped on an unstable rock which popped out of the raw dirt like a rotten tooth coming loose from a gum. He bit back an outcry as he began to fall. He scrabbled with his fingers, digging into the mud, but his body slid down, tumbling, rolling, covering his clothes in dirt and mud. Rocks pattered around him. As he bounced and slid, Jody saw Dorman standing at the lip of the mudslide, his hands outstretched like claws, ready to bend down and grab him. But the boy was too far away, still falling, still picking up speed. Jody rolled, struck his side and then his head, but he remained conscious, terrified that he would break his legs so that he couldn't keep running away from Dorman. He finally came to rest at the bottom of the slide, up against one of the toppled trees. Then to his horror, he saw Jeremy Dorman bounding down the sharp slope up above, somehow keeping his balance. He waved the revolver in his hand in a threat to keep Jody where he was, not that Jody could have gotten up and moved fast enough anyway. Dorman skidded to a halt just above the boy. His face was flushed, and his skin looked as if it were crawling, writhing, seething like a pot of candle wax slowly coming to a boil. Rage and exertion contorted the man's face. He held the handgun up, gripping it with both hands and pointing the barrel directly at Jody. It looked like a cyclopean eye, a deadly open mouth viper. Then Dorman's shoulder sagged, and he just stared at the boy for a few moments. Jody, all I need is some of your blood, Jody. That's all. Just some blood. Fresh blood. Both the boy and the man were so intent on each other, neither heard the other person approach. Freeze! Federal agent! Dana Scully stood in the trees, fifteen feet away, her feet braced, her arms extended and gripping her handgun in a precise firing position. Don't move, she said. You're one of them, the boy whispered. Scully wondered how much Patrice Kennessy had told him, how much Jody knew about the death of his father and the possible conspiracy involving Dimar. But what astonished her the most was the appearance of the boy. He seemed healthy, 
not gaunt and haggard, not pale and sickly. He should have been in the final stages of terminal lymphoblastic leukemia. The large man scowled at Scully, dismissed her, and tried to ease closer to the boy. I said, don't move, sir, Scully said. Seeing the revolver hanging loosely in his hand, she feared he might take Jody in a hostage situation. Put your gun down, she said, and identify yourself. The man looked at her with such pure disgust and impatience that she felt cold. You don't know what's going on here, he said. Stop interfering. He looked hungrily back down at the trapped Jody, then snapped his glance towards Scully once more. Or are you one of them? Just like the boy says, out to annihilate both of us. Before she could answer or question him further, a black shape like a rocket-propelled battering ram bounded from the underbrush and launched itself toward the man-threatening Jody. In a flash, Scully recognized the dog, the black lab that had somehow survived being struck by a car, that had escaped from the veterinarian's office and gone on the run with Patrice and Jody. Vader! Jody cried. The dog lunged. Black Labradors were not normally used as attack dogs, but Vader must have been able to sense the fear and tension in the air. He knew who the enemy was, and he fought back. The burly man whirled, raising his gun and gripping the trigger with a sudden unexpected threat, but the dog crashed into him, growling and snarling, spoiling his aim. The man cried out, threw up his free hand to ward off the attack, and his finger squeezed the trigger. The explosion roared through the quiet isolation far from the main road. Instead of taking off Jody's head, the thirty-eight caliber slammed into the boy's chest before he could throw himself out of the way. The impact sprayed blood behind him, hurling the boy's lean frame back against the fallen tree, as if someone with an invisible piano wire had just jerked him backward. Jody cried out and slid down the rain-slick bowl of the fallen tree. Vader bore the gunman to the ground. The man tried to fight the dog off, but the vicious black lab bit at his face, his throat. Scully raced over to the wounded boy, dropped to her knees, and cradled Jody's head. Oh, my God! The boy blinked, his eyes wide with astonishment, and seemingly far away. Blood bubbled out of his mouth, and he spat it aside. So tired. She stroked his hair, unable to think of the big man who had shot him. She could tell from the placement of the wound that no simple first aid would do Jody any good. The dog continued growling, snapping his jaws, digging his muzzle into the man's throat, ripping at the tendons. Scully stared at where foamy scarlet blood blossomed from the center of Jody's chest. A hole with neat round edges stood out against a welling, pulsing lake of blood. Oh no, she said and bent down, tearing Jody's shirt wider and looking at the gunshot wound that had penetrated his left lung and perhaps struck the heart. A serious wound. A deadly wound. He would never survive. Jody's skin turned gray and pale. His eyes were closed in unconsciousness. Blood continued to pour from the bullet hole. Kennessy's Cabin, Coast Range, Oregon. Friday, 2.20 p.m. The sudden carnage astonished Scully, and time seemed to stop as the forest pressed around her. The smell of blood and black powder from the gunshots. The bird's song and the breeze fell silent. She grabbed Vader by the skin of his neck, grappling with his strong shoulders and front forepaws to pull him away. His bloodied victim lay twitching in the mud, leaves and twigs. She tugged at the dog, dragging him away. She whirled back toward Jody, who still lay gasping and bleeding from the bullet wound in his chest. She tore off more of his shirt sleeve and pressed the wadded cloth hard upon the open bubbling wound. Scully couldn't imagine how the boy might survive. But she didn't try to think at all, just went into a fugue state, treating him, doing what she knew best. She had lost fellow agents before, other people injured on cases, but she felt a unique affinity with Jody. The twelve-year-old also suffered from a form of terminal cancer. Both he and Scully were victims of the vagaries of fate, the mutations of one cell too many. Jody had already been given a death sentence by his own biology. But Scully didn't intend to let a tragic accident rob him of his last month or so of life. This was one thing she could control. She fumbled in her pocket and pulled out the cellular phone. With shaking, blood-tipped fingers, she punched in the programmed number for Mulder's phone, but all she received was a burst of static. She was out of range in the isolated wooded hills. Scully was alone. Looks like I'll have to take you myself then, she said grimly, and bent over to gather up the young man above and beyond the call of duty. Scully gently positioned Jody inside the car. 
She pressed more cloth against the bullet hole and then jumped into the driver's seat and started the car. She drove off at a reckless speed up the bumpy dirt road. Federal Office Building, Crystal City, Virginia, Friday, 12.08 p.m. The phone rang in Adam Lentz's plain government office, and he grabbed for it immediately. Very few people knew his direct number, so the call had to be important. Hello, he said, keeping his voice neutral. Lentz listened to the voice on the other end of the phone, feeling a sudden chill. Yes, sir, he answered. In fact, Lentz said, my plane leaves for Portland within the hour. I'm going to head up the Mobile Tactical Command Center there. I want to be on the site so I can take care of things personally. He listened to the voice, detecting no displeasure, no scorn, only the faintest background lilt of sarcasm. Lentz looked at his topographical maps of the Oregon wilderness. With a flat voice, he listed where the six teams had concentrated their searches, rattling off one after another. He did not need to make his efforts sound extravagant or impressive, just competent. Finally, though, a hint of criticism came from the other end of the phone conversation. We had thought all of the controlled samples of Kennedy's nanomachines were destroyed. And the dog? That's a rather large mistake. Lynn swallowed. We believe those efforts had been successful after the fire at Dimar. We had sent sterilization crews in to retrieve any unburned records. We found the fire safe and the videotape, but nothing else. Yes, the man said on the phone. But from the condition of the dead security guard, as well as several other bodies, we must assume that some of the nanomachines have escaped. We'll get them, sir, Lentz said. We're doing our best to track down the fugitives. Finding the dog should be no problem. When we complete our mission, I assure you there won't be any samples remaining. That isn't a suggestion, the voice said. That's the way it must be. And one last thing. You would do well to keep your eye on Agent Mulder. Make sure part of your team is specifically assigned to shadowing his movements, following everything he does. Eavesdrop on every one of his conversations. If you stay close to him, he may well lead you exactly where you need to be. Kennedy's Cabin, Coast Range, Oregon. Friday, 3.15 p.m. When Mulder arrived at the cabin, it was quiet, empty, abandoned. He could see someone had driven here recently and then departed again. Could Scully have gone already? Where would she go? When he discovered the woman's body lying in the grass, he knew it was Patrice Kennessy, without a doubt. Mulder frowned and stepped back away from her. Patrice's skin had been ravaged by the same disease he had just seen on the dead truck driver. He swallowed hard. With a sheen of sweat on his forehead, Mulder broke into a trot, looking ahead, then back down to the ground as he followed a scarlet blood trail back into the forest. Now he saw footprints, Scully's shoes, paw prints from a dog, his heart, beat faster. Mulder found his way to the base of a steep slope where a mudslide had gouged the hillside. Near one of the horizontal trunks, Mulder saw the blood-smeared man with broad shoulders, tattered clothes, and a mangled throat ripped all the way down to the neck bone. He recognized the burly man from the Dimar personnel photos, from the surveillance video from the truck way station. Jeremy Dorman. Certainly dead now. Mulder also smelled gunpowder beyond the blood. The dead man's hand clutched a service revolver. From the smell, Mulder could tell it had been recently fired, but Dorman didn't look as if he'd be firing it again any time soon. Mulder bent over to inspect the gaping wound in the man's throat. Had the black lab attacked him? But even as he watched, Dorman's mangled larynx and the muscle tissue and skin around it looked melted, smoothing itself over, as if someone had sealed it with candle wax. His throat injury was filled with translucent mucus, slime oozing over the mangled skin. Around him, Mulder saw signs of a struggle where rocks and mud had slid down the slope. It looked as if someone had fallen over the edge and then been pursued. He saw more of the dog's footprints, Scully's shoe prints, and smaller prints. The boys? Then the dead man on the ground lurched up as if spring-loaded. His claw-like left hand grabbed the edge of Mulder's overcoat. Mulder cried out and struggled backward, but the desperate man clung to his coat. Without changing his cadaverous expression, Jeremy Dorman brought up the revolver he held in his hand, pointing it threateningly at Mulder. Mulder looked down and saw the clutching hand, its covering of skin squirming, moving, infested with nanomachines, slicked with a coating of slime. A contagious mucus, the carrier of the deadly nanotech plague. Oregon Wilderness, Friday, 4.19 p.m. 
Fifty miles at least to the nearest hospital, along tangled roads through wooded mountains, and Scully didn't know exactly where she was going. She raced away as the lowering sun glittered through the trees, and then the clouds closed over again. In the back seat, Vader whimpered, very upset. Clumps of blood and foam bristled from his muzzle. She hadn't taken time to clean him up. He snuffled the motionless boy on the seat beside him. In the back seat, Jody gasped, and his spine arched with some kind of convulsion. Scully jerked the car to a stop in the middle of the road and unbuckled her seatbelt to reach back, dreading to find that the boy had finally succumbed to death, that he had reached the limits of endurance. She touched him. Jody's skin was hot and feverish, damp with sweat. His skin burned. Despite all her medical training, Scully still didn't know what to do. Beside her, the cell phone still displayed no service on its little screen. She had felt incredibly isolated, like the survivalists in the group where Jody's uncle had gone to hide. She wished Mulder were here. She wished she could at least call him. When Jody coughed and sat up in the back seat, looking groggy but otherwise perfectly healthy, Scully nearly drove off the road. Vader barked and nuzzled the young man, crawling all over him, slobbering on him, utterly happy to see Jody restored. Scully slammed on the brakes. The car slowed onto the soft shoulder, and she came to a stop near an unmarked dirt road. Jody, she cried. You're all right. She popped open her door and raced to the back of the car, leaving the driver's side open. In the back, she bent over, grasping Jody by the shoulders. She saw that skin had folded over the gunshot wound in his chest, clean and smooth with a plastic appearance. Jody, do you know what happened to you? She said. Jody shrugged. Something my dad did, he yawned. Nanotech. No, no, he called them nano critters. Biological policemen to make me better from the leukemia, fix me up. He made me promise not to tell anybody. Not even my mom. She drove off slower this time, aimless. David Kennessy had developed something wonderful, something astonishing. She realized the power he had tapped into at Dimar Laboratory. It had been a federally funded cancer research facility, and this work had a profound meaning for the millions of cancer patients each year, people like herself. It was appalling and unethical for Dr. Kennessy to have given his own son such an unproven and risky course of treatment, but then again she understood the heartache, the desperate need to do something, anything, taking desperate measures when none of the normal ones would suffice. Scully set her jaw and drove along. After the plague victim she and Mulder had seen, it appeared that something must have gone wrong with Kennedy's experiments. Very wrong. Kennedy's Cabin, Coast Range, Oregon, Friday, 4.23 p.m. The wounds in Jeremy Dorman's throat had sealed, and a tangible heat emanated from him, a pulsing warmth that radiated from his skin and body. The supposedly dead man opened his mouth and formed words, but only a whispery gurgle came from his ruined voice box. He jabbed with the revolver and hissed words using only modulated breath. Your weapon. <laughs> Drop it. Mulder dropped his handgun on the forest floor with a thump. It struck the mud, slid to one side, and rested against a clump of dried pine needles. Nanotechnology, Mulder said, trying to quell the wonder in his voice. You're healing yourself. You're one of them, Dorman said, his voice harsh, his breath still grievously wounded. One of those men. Then he released his grip on Mulder's overcoat, leaving a handprint of slime that seeped into the fabric, spreading, moving of its own accord like an amoebae. Can I take off my coat? Mulder asked, trying to keep the alarm out of his voice. Go ahead. Dorman heaved himself to his feet, still holding the revolver. Mulder shed his outer jacket, keeping only his dark spore coat. How did you find me? Dorman said. Who are you? I'm with the FBI. My name is Mulder. I've been looking for Patrice and Jody Kennessy. I'm after them, not you. Though I would certainly like to know how you survived the Dimar fire, Mr. Dorman. The man snorted. FBI. I knew you were involved in the conspiracy. You're trying to suppress information. Destroy our discoveries. You thought I was dead. You thought you had killed me. Mulder would have laughed under any other circumstances. No one's ever accused me of being involved in a conspiracy. I assure you I had never heard of you, or David Kennessy, or Dimar Laboratory before the destruction of the facility. He paused. 
You're contaminated with something from Kennedy's research, aren't you? I am the research, Dorman said, raising his voice, which was still rough and rocky. Something in his chest squirmed beneath the tattered covering of his shirt. Dorman winced, nearly doubled over. It looks to me like the research still needs a little work, Mulder said. Dorman gestured with the revolver for Mulder to turn around. You have a vehicle here? Mulder nodded, thinking of the battered red pickup. So to speak. We're going to get out of here. You have to help me find Jody, or at least the dog. They're with the other one, the woman. You're going to help me, Agent Mulder. Now Dorman's voice had an edge. I see. The same thing is happening to you as happened to your victims, Mulder said, but much more slowly. Your body is falling apart and you think Jody's blood will save you somehow. Dorman sighed. The nanocritters in his system are completely stable. That's what I need. They're working the way they should. Not flawed, with contradictory errors like mine. The dog's nanocritters are good too, but Jody's are already conformed to human DNA. Dorman drew a deep breath and Mulder realized that the man had no reason to believe his own theory. He merely hoped against hope that this speculation was true. If I can get an infusion of stable nanocritters, they'll be stronger than my warped ones. They will supersede the infestation in my own body and give them a new blueprint. He looked intensely at Mulder, as if he wanted to grab the FBI agent and shake his shoulders. Is that so wrong? When the two men reached the old pickup parked in front of the cabin, Dorman yanked open his creaking door. Okay, let's go. He slid onto the seat, but remained as far toward the passenger side as possible, avoiding contact. We've got to find them. Mulder drove off, trapped in the same vehicle with the man whose touch caused instant death. Tactical Team Temporary Command Post, Oregon District, Friday, 6.10 p.m. To Adam Lance and his crew of professionals, the fugitives were leaving a trail of clues like muddy footprints on a snow-white carpet. He had flown into Portland discreet and professional. He had been met at the airport and whisked off to the rendezvous point. Other team members converged at the site of a local police call. Their first stop. Their high-tech mobile sanitation van arrived, escorted by a black sedan. Men in black suits and ties boiled out of the open doors next to where a logging truck had swerved off the road. The report had come in over the airwaves, and Lentz's response team had scrambled. A state trooper, Officer Jared Penwick, had remained at the scene. Next to him, huddled in the patrol car passenger seat, obviously not a prisoner, was an old man wearing a red, wide-billed cap and a rain slicker. The men in suits flashed their badges and announced themselves as operatives from the federal government. They all wore sidearms. They moved quickly as a unit. The doors to the cleanup van popped open, and men in spacesuit-like anti-contamination gear clambered out, armed with plastic bags and foam guns. The team member in the rear carried a flamethrower. What's going on here? Officer Penwick said, stepping toward them. We're the official cleanup team, Lentz answered. He hadn't even bothered to take out his badge. We would appreciate your full cooperation. He stood stoically out of range, beyond the risk of contamination, as the crew opened the truck driver's door and descended upon the victim with plastic wrapping. They sprayed thick foam and acid, using extreme decontamination efforts. They quickly had the dead trucker bundled, his arms and legs bent so he could be wrapped up like a dying caterpillar in a cocoon. The trooper watched everything wide-eyed. Hey, you can't just take... We're doing this to eliminate all risk of contamination, sir. Did you or this gentleman hear... He nodded toward the man in the rain slicker. Actually open up the truck cab or go inside? No, Officer Penwick said. But there was an FBI agent with us. Agent Mulder. One of your people, I suppose? Lentz didn't answer. The trooper continued. He commandeered this man's pickup truck and headed off. He said he had to meet his partner, which had something to do with the situation. I've been waiting here for... He glanced at his watch. Close to an hour. We'll take care of everything from this point on, sir. Don't concern yourself. Lentz stepped back, shielding his eyes, as the suited man with the flamethrower sprayed jellied gasoline inside the cab of the logging truck, and then ignited it with a whoop and a roar. Holy shit, said the man in the rain slicker. 
He slammed the door of the patrol car as a wave of heat ruffled over them, sending clouds of steam from the wet weeds and asphalt. You'd best step back, Lentz said to the trooper. The gas tank will blow any minute. Later, the trooper gave Lentz directions on how to find Darren Kennessy's cabin. Lentz wrote nothing down but memorized every word. He had to restrain himself from shaking his head. A trail like muddy footprints on a snow-white carpet. The men climbed back into the black sedan while the rest of the crew sealed the cleanup van and its driver started the engine. Hey! The old man in the rain slicker opened the passenger door of the trooper's car and stood up. He shouted at Lentz, When do I get my pickup back? If the image of Agent Fox Mulder driving around in a battered redneck pickup truck amused Lentz, his face betrayed no expression. We'll do everything we can, sir. There's no need to worry. Lentz then climbed into the sedan and the team raced off to Kennessy's isolated cabin. Oregon Backroads, Friday, 6.17 p.m. With a brief sigh from the back seat, Jody woke up again at dusk, refreshed, fully healed, and ready to talk. Who are you, lady? Jody asked, startling her again. My name is Dana. Just call me Dana. I was here looking for you. I wanted to make sure you got to the hospital before your cancer got any worse. I don't need the hospital, Jody said with a lilt in his voice that made it clear he thought the answer to that was plain. Not anymore. Scully drove aimlessly into the dusk. An hour ago, she had decided not to take him directly to any medical center, but she didn't know where else to go, who else to trust. She hadn't been able to reach Mulder. And why is it that you don't need a hospital? Scully asked. I've seen your medical records, Jody. You're a very sick boy. I was sick. Cancer, Jody said confidently. But I'm fixed now. Or most of the way. He patted Vader on the head. He suddenly looked at her with suspicion. Are you one of those people chasing after us? Are you the one my mom was so afraid of? No, Scully said. I was trying to save you from those people. You were very hard to find, Jody. Your mom did a good job of hiding you. She bit her lip, knowing what he was going to ask next. And he did. Looking around the back seat, suddenly realizing where he was. Hey! What happened to my mom? Where is she? Jeremy was chasing her and she told me to run. Scully drew a deep breath and slowed the car. She didn't want to be distracted by any sharp curves or road hazards, as she told Jody Kennessy that his mother was dead. Oregon Back Roads, Friday, 6.24 p.m. As the pickup truck droned on and the darkness deepened, at least Mulder didn't have to look at Jeremy Dorman, didn't have to see the sickening, squirming, and unexplained motion of his body. Dorman lifted his heavy-lidded eyes, and when he noticed the antenna of Mulder's cellular phone poking from the pocket of his suit jacket, he sat up indignantly. Your phone, Agent Mulder. Use it. Pull it out and dial your partner. We can find them that way. So far, Mulder had avoided bringing this monstrously distorted man anywhere close to his partner or the innocent boy in her possession. But now he didn't see any way he could talk himself out of it. Mulder gripped the steering wheel with his left hand, compensating from side to side to maintain a steady course on the uneven road. He yanked out the phone and punched in Scully's speed dial number. To his surprise, the phone rang. Tactical Team Temporary Command Post, Oregon District, Friday, 6.36 p.m. As the two vehicles toiled down the muddy rutted drive, Lentz couldn't believe they had missed the obvious connection all this time. Earlier, they had quietly checked out the survivalist enclave where David Kennessy's brother Darren had gone to ground, thinking himself invisible and protected. But Patrice had not gone there. There was no sign of the dog or the twelve-year-old boy. He directed the teams in the cleanup van to put on fresh protective gear and prepare for another sterilization routine. Lentz stood back, drew a deep breath, inhaling the resiny scent of the nearby forest, the damp perfume of the clean, fresh meadow. He turned to one of the men. Burn the cabin to the ground, he said. Make sure nothing remains. Lentz didn't bother to stay and watch the fire. He went back to the car where the radio systems tapped into other satellite uplinks and receiving dishes, to cellular phone tapping or jamming devices, and security descramblers. Other members of the extended tactical squadron had been keeping tabs on Agent Mulder, and now Lentz required whatever information they could give him. 
Mulder could be the one to lead them right where they needed to be. Oregon Back Roads, Friday, 6.47 p.m. Scully's cellular phone rang in the quiet darkness of the car's front seat. She snatched it up knowing who it must be, relieved to be back in touch with her partner at last. She yanked out the antenna while driving with one hand. Scully, it's me. Mother, I've been trying to reach you for hours, she said quickly, before he could say anything. Listen, this is important. I've got Jody Kennessy with me. He's healed from his leukemia. And he's got amazing regenerative abilities, but he's in danger. We're both in danger. Her breath caught in her throat. Mulder, he doesn't have the plague. He has the cure. I know, Scully. It's Kennedy's nanotechnology. The actual plague carrier is Jeremy Dorman, and he's sitting right here next to me. A little too close. But I don't have much choice at the moment. Dorman was alive. She couldn't believe it. She had looked at the blood-soaked body, his hands still twitching. No human being could have survived an injury such as that. Mulder, I saw the dog attack him, tear his throat out. But then Scully realized she never would have believed young Jody could live after the gunshot wound he had received. Dorman's got the nanomachines in him as well, Mulder said. But his are malfunctioning. Rather spectacularly, I'd say. Jody leaned forward, concerned. What is it, Dana? Is Jeremy after us? He's got my partner, Scully muttered quietly to the boy. She pulled into a clearing at the side of the road. She hadn't noticed the town's name as she drove along, but from the direction she had been heading, Scully knew she must be nearing the suburbs around Portland. Mulder, are you all right? She said. Dorman needs something from Jody, some of his blood. Scully interrupted. I stopped him before, or at least I tried. I won't let Jody get hurt. Mulder's voice fell silent for a few seconds on the phone. Then she heard a scuffle. Mulder, are you all right? She called out, wondering what was happening and how far away she was from helping him. He didn't answer her. Mobile Tactical Command Center, Northwestern Oregon, Friday, 7.01 p.m. Satellite dishes mounted atop the van tilted at different azimuths to tap into various relay satellites. Computer signal processors sifted through the complex medley of transmissions broadcast by hundreds of thousands of unsuspecting people. The van sat parked at the terminus of a short dirt road that ended in a shallow dumping ground. They had continued their invisible surveillance for hours with no success, but Adam Lentz was not a man to give up. Unless he broached the subject himself, the rest of his team members would not dare to comment on the matter either. He can't know we're looking for him, Lentz muttered. The man at the command console looked over, his face stony, reflecting no surprise whatsoever. We've been very discreet, the man said. Lentz tapped his fingertips on the dashboard, pondering. He knew Mulder and Scully had split up. Agent Mulder had seen the dead trucker whose body Lentz's team had cleanly eliminated. Both Mulder and Scully had been to Dorman's isolated cabin out in the hollow, which, along with the body of Patrice Kennessy, was now a pile of smoldering ashes. Then they had fled, and Lentz believed either Agent Mulder or Scully had the boy Jody and his nanotech-infected dog. But something else was spreading the plague. Patrice Kennessy and the boy had feared something. Was the dog going rampant? Had the nanomachines within it, as Lentz had witnessed so clearly and so brutally in the videotaped demonstration, somehow gone haywire so that they now destroyed human beings? The prospect frightened him and he knew that his superiors were absolutely right in insisting that all such dangerous research be contained. Only responsible, authorized people should know about it. He had to restore order to the world. The man at the command deck sat up quickly. Incoming, he said. He pushed down his earphones and fiddled with switches on his receiver. He handed the earphones to Lentz, who quickly snugged them in place. The technician fiddled with the controls and the recorder. Lentz listened to a staticky, warbled conversation between Mulder and Scully. In spite of his own tight control over his reactions, Lentz's eyes went wide and his eyebrows lifted. Yes, Scully had the boy and the dog in her custody, and the boy had healed himself from a grievous wound. 
But the most astonishing news of all was that the organization's patsy, Jeremy Dorman, had not been killed in the Dimar fire after all. He was still alive, still a threat, and now Dorman, too, was a carrier of the rogue nanotechnology. And so was the boy. It was already spreading. After various threats and explanations, Dorman and Agent Scully worked to arrange a time and a place where they could meet. Mulder and Scully, Dorman, Jody, and the dog were all falling right into his lap. If Lentz's team could set up their trap sufficiently ahead of time. As soon as the cellular transmission ended, Lentz launched his team into motion. We have to get there first, Lentz said. Dimar Laboratory Ruins, Friday. 8.45 p.m. Back to the haunted house. Scully thought as she drove up the steep driveway to the gutted, fire-blackened ruins of the Dimar Laboratory. As Scully passed through the open and too inviting chain-link gate, she heard a car door slam. She whirled, expecting to see Mulder and his captor, the big man who had shot Jody. But it was only the boy climbing out of the car and looking around curiously. The black lab bounded out next to him, anxious to be free. Be careful, Jody, she called. I'm following you, he said. Before she could scold him, he added, I don't want to be left alone. Scully didn't want him to go into the burned ruins with her, but she couldn't blame him either. All right, come on then. Scully thought she heard a sound and proceeded cautiously toward the bulldozer. Fuel tanks sat near the heavy equipment. The demolitions crew had been ready to begin and she wondered if the unusual rush to level the place had anything to do with the cover-up plans Dorman had talked about. She heard the approach of another engine, a vehicle rattling and laboring up the slope, tires crunching on the gravel. Twin headlights swept through the night like bright coins. It was an old red pickup truck patched with primer, rusted on the sides. The body groaned and creaked as the driver's door opened and Mulder climbed out. Of all the unbelievable things she had witnessed with Fox Mulder, Seeing her strictly suit-and-tie partner driving a battered old pickup ranked among the most unusual. Fancy meeting you here, Scully, Mulder said. A larger form heaved itself out of the passenger side. Jeremy Dorman had looked bad before, and now he appeared even worse. Scully took a step forward but kept herself in front of Jody. Are you all right, Mulder? For now, he said. Jody came hesitantly forward, standing close behind Scully. Jeremy... Why are you doing this? he said. You're as bad as, as bad as them. Dorman's shoulders sagged. I'm sorry, Jody, he said. You can see how this is affecting me. I had to come here. You can help me. It's the only way I know how to survive. Jody said nothing. Other people are after us, Jody, Dorman said. He took a step closer. Scully did not back away maintaining herself as a barrier between them. We're being hunted down by government officials, people trying to bury your dad's work so that no other cancer patients will ever be helped. No one else will be cured like you were. These men want to keep that cure for themselves. At that point, as if on cue, other figures appeared, shadowy silhouettes, men in dark suits emerging from the perimeter of the chain-link fence. They came out of the trees in the access road. Another group came up from the steep driveway with bright flashlights blazing. We have evidence that suggests otherwise, Mr. Dorman, said one of the men in the lead. We're your reinforcements, Agent Mulder. We'll take care of the situation from here. Dorman looked around wildly and glared at Mulder as if the agent had betrayed him. The men came closer. Their dark suits acted as camouflage in the shadowy overhangs in the burned building. Identify yourselves, Scully said. These men don't carry business cards, Scully. Mulder said. Jeremy is the one who killed your dad, Jody. Shot him four times, I believe. At least that's the number of slugs we took out of his burned body. You bastard! Dorman wailed in despair. Scully was too astonished to respond, but it was clear to her that Dorman realized he would never convince the boy to help him. Not now. With a roar, swinging his two flexible arms, Jeremy Dorman brought up the revolver in his hand, aiming at Lentz. The other team members were much faster, though. They snatched their own weapons and opened fire. Dimar Laboratory Ruins Friday, 9.03 p.m. The hail of small-caliber bullets struck Jeremy Dorman, and he thrashed out his arms in a scream of pain. 
as his body suddenly went haywire. Agents Mulder and Scully both dove to one side, reacting according to their training. Jody cried out as Scully dragged the boy with her, scrambling towards shelter among the large construction equipment. Mulder moved away, shouting for the men to hold their fire, but no one paid the slightest attention to him. Dorman himself remained the focus of all the shooting. He had known these men wanted to take him down, though he doubted that they had known he was still alive, until now. They did not know what had changed inside of him, how he was different. Adam Lentz had betrayed him before. The people in the organization that had promised him his own laboratory, the ability to continue the nanotechnology research, had already attempted to destroy him. Now they were here to finish the job. As two hot bullets struck him, one high in the shoulder and the other on the left side of his ribcage, the pain and adrenaline and fury destroyed the last vestiges of control on his own body. He let slip his hold on the systems that had played havoc with his genetic structure, his muscles and nerves. He roared a wordless howl of outrage, and his body changed. His skin stretched like a trembling drumhead. Inside, his muscles convulsed and clenched. The wild, tumorous growths that had protruded from his ribs, his skin, his neck, came loose, ripping their way through his already mangled shirt. The mass of protrusions had already fought themselves free one time previously, while he had been trapped with Wayne Hikeaway in the logging truck. But that loss of control was nothing compared to the unleashed biological chaos he exhibited now, a wild card reorganization that the nanocritters had found in his most primitive DNA coating. His shoulders groaned, his biceps bulged, and his arms bent and twisted. Another whipping tumor crawled out of his throat from the base of his tongue, the skin on his face and neck ran like melting plastic. The men in dark suits continued to fire at him, in alarm and self-defense now. But Dorman's bodily integrity was breaking down, mutating, able to absorb the impacts like soft clay. From his position in the lead of the team, Adam Lentz reacted quickly, retreating to cover as the gunfire continued. Dorman charged forward to attack the nearest dark-suited man with one twisted arm while tentacles whipped out in a hideously primeval mass from his body. The government man's cool professionalism quickly degenerated into a scream as an explosion of fleshy protrusions, tentacled claws, a nightmare of bizarre biological abominations wrapped around his arms, his chest, his neck. Dorman squeezed and strangled until the man broke like balsa kindling in his grasp. Another bullet shattered Dorman's femur, but before he could collapse, the nanomachines knitted the bone together again, allowing him to charge forward to snare another victim. The hot, translucent slime covered Dorman's body, providing a vehicle for the seething nanocritters. He needed only to touch the enemy men, and the cellular plague would instantly eradicate their systems. But his out-of-control body took great delight in snapping their necks, crushing their windpipes, folding up their rib cages like accordions. The single tentacle whipped out of his mouth like the long, sharp tongue of a serpent, lashing the air. He didn't know how to interpret his senses anymore. He had no idea how much, or how little, humanity still remained within him. For now, he saw only the enemy, the conspirators, the traitors, and his buzzing, disintegrating brain thought only of killing them. But even as he continued the struggle, Dorman felt disoriented. His vision blurred and distorted. The surrounding agents brought more weapons to bear. The bullet impacts drove him away and Dorman stumbled backward. A dim spark in his mind made him remember the Dimar Laboratory, the rooms where Darren and David Kennessy had developed their fantastic work, work that even now had brought them to this threshold of disaster. Like a wounded animal fleeing into its lair, Jeremy Dorman lurched into the burned wreckage, seeking refuge, and the men with the weapons charged after him. Dimar Laboratory Ruins, Friday, 9.19 p.m. When the shots rang out, Mulder was instantly afraid that he, Scully, and young Jody would all be mowed down in the rain of bullets. He ducked to one side, seeking shelter. Thanks to Dorman, he no longer had a handgun of his own, but Scully was still armed. Scully, stay with the boy, he shouted. He heard the solid, wet impact of bullets striking skin, and Dorman roared in pain. Mulder scuttled along the darkened ground, ducking behind fallen beams and broken walls. He looked up as the ululating sound emanating from the ominous fugitive who had held him hostage turned more bestial, less defined. 
Jeremy Dorman transformed into a monster before his eyes. All the horrors of wild cellular growth, the reckless spread of a malignant cancer with a mind of its own extended like some ill-defined creature that had lain dormant inside Dorman's cells, now spreading forth, growing without a plan, like tracked home developments approved by a bribed city council, he thought. And this cellular assault was unleashed with a predatory mind bent on attack and destruction. From her vantage, Scully couldn't see the details. She shielded Jody with her own body and ran over to the shelter of the nearby bulldozer. With the bright, echoing sound of metal upon metal, bullets ricocheted from the armored side of the machine. Scully dove down into the shadows, knocking Jody to safety. Over by the bulldozer, Jody shouted in despair as his dog let out a long and nerve-grating chain of barks and growls. Raising his head, Mulder saw a dark shadow, the black Labrador racing into the ruins. Vader barked and snapped as he pursued Jeremy Dorman. Lentz's other agents also crept up to the labyrinthine wreckage, but they were wary now. Dorman had withstood their hail of gunfire, and he had already killed several of their members. One of the agents pinned Dorman with a flashlight beam, attempting to stun him like a deer facing oncoming headlights. With a grunt, the monstrous man shoved sideways against a support pillar, knocking a charred wooden pole down along with a shower of concrete blocks. The agent with the flashlight tried to scramble back, but the wreckage fell on his upper leg. Part of the wall collapsed. Mulder heard the hard bamboo sound of bone breaking. Then the dark-suited man who had been so calm as he hunted down his victim yelped in pain. He had a high-pitched, bawling voice. Somewhere inside the burned building, the dog barked. Mulder tried to stay under cover, but he made plenty of noise as he tripped over fallen bricks and crunched broken glass. He ducked behind a slumped, charred desk as more gunfire rang out. He realized that these shots couldn't be accidental misfires, though they would be excused as such. To the men who had surrounded the Dimar site and tried to kill Dorman and Jody, it might also prove advantageous if Agents Mulder and Scully were also accidentally caught in the line of fire. Dimar Laboratory Ruins Friday, 9.38 p.m. The trap had sprung, not as neatly as Adam Lentz had hoped, perhaps, but still the results would be the same, if a bit messier. Messes could be cleaned up. Though Lentz himself had ducked out of the way of Dorman in his plague-laced slime, he was still disappointed in how his team's cool efficiency had so quickly shattered into a backwash of vengeance. Lentz stopped at the nearest tactical vehicle, reached into the front seat, and took out the demolition controls. But he had to wait for the right moment. No trace would remain. Lentz didn't particularly want to obliterate his team members who had foolishly followed Dorman inside, chasing him in a cat-and-mouse routine among the falling-down walls. But they were expendable. Each man had been aware of the risks when he signed up. Agent Mulder had also vanished inside, and Lentz suspected that some of the gunfire was also directed at him. The team members would have taken it upon themselves to eradicate all witnesses. Lentz had received clear instructions that Mulder was not to be killed. He and his partner Scully were already part of a larger plan, but Lentz had to make on-the-spot decisions. He had to set priorities. And seeing the rampaging thing that had become unleashed inside Dorman's body had hardened him to the extreme necessity. If he had to, Lentz would make excuses to his superiors. Mulder and Scully both knew too much, after all. And this weapon, this breakthrough, this cure of rampant nanotechnology had to be controlled, no matter what the cost. Only certain people could be trusted with so much power. And the time was now. He took one last look at the blackened skeletal building and pushed the indicated button. The Dimar Laboratory erupted in fresh flames. Dimar Laboratory Ruins Friday, 9.47 p.m. The shock wave toppled some of the remaining girders in the once solid concrete wall. The metal desk sheltered Mulder from the worst of the blast, but still the hammer of heat pressed the heavy piece of furniture against the wall, nearly crushing him. Flames swept upward, bright yellow and orange, moving rapidly as if by magic. He'd thought most of the flammables would have been consumed in the first fire two weeks earlier. Shielding his eyes from the glare and the hot wind, Mulder could see from the magnitude of the blaze that someone had rigged the ruins to go up in an instant inferno. The dark-suited men had planned for this. Hearing a shriek of terror and pain, 
Mulder carefully raised his head, blinking his watery eyes against the furnace blast of the inferno. He saw one of the men who had hunted after him stumbling through the wreckage, his suit engulfed in flames. More gunshots rang out, frantic firepower amongst shouts and screams, and a barking dog. The fire raced up along the wooden support beams. The heat was so intense even the glass and broken stones seemed to have caught fire. The black Labrador had bounded into the building, gotten caught in the explosion, and was thrown against a wall. Vader's fur was smoking, but still he ran, casting about for something. Mulder stood up from behind the desk, shielding his eyes. Vader! he shouted. Hey! Over here! That black dog was evidence. That dog's bloodstream carried functional nanotechnology that could be studied to save so many people, without the horrendous mutations Jeremy Dorman had suffered. The dog was hopelessly lost inside the facility. Mulder couldn't understand why Vader had run into such a dangerous area in the first place. The unstable floor was on fire. The walls, the debris. Even the air burned his lungs with each gasping, retching breath he drew. Mulder didn't know how he was going to get out alive. Scully clutched Jody's torn shirt, but the fabric ripped and pulled free as he lunged after his dog. Jody, no! But the boy charged after Vader. She ran to the threshold and squinted through the smoke. A girder tumbled as the ceiling collapsed, showering sparks. Part of the floor showed gaps and holes where the flames and the explosions beneath had weakened it, causing it to crack and tumble down in sections like a house of cards. Jody stood half-balanced, flailing his hands. Vader! Where are you, Vader? Throwing all caution to the wind, needing to save the boy as if it were some measure of her own worthiness to survive, Scully hurried inside. Vader! Jody called again, out of sight. Finally, Scully reached the boy's side and grabbed his arm. We have to go, Jody. Out of here. The whole place is going to collapse. Scully! Muller shouted, his voice raw and ragged with the smoke and heat. She turned to see him making his way across the floor, stepping in flames and racing along. He swatted out a fire that smoldered on his trousers. She gestured for him to hurry, but then a wall behind her crumbled. Concrete blocks fell to one side in a mound of cinders as a wooden support beam split. Hello, Jody. Jeremy Dorman's tortured voice said as he pushed himself through the fire and debris of the wall he had just knocked down. The distorted man stood free, undisturbed by the heat raging around him. Embers pattered on his body, smoking on his skin and leaving black craters that shifted and melted and healed over. His body ran like candle wax. His clothes were fully involved in the fire that blazed around him, but his skin thrashed and writhed, a horror show of tentacles and growths. Dorman blocked their way out. Jody, you wouldn't help me when I asked. And now look what's happened. Jody bit back a small scream and only glared at the hideously mutated creature. You killed my dad! Dorman lunged closer, reaching out to him with a flame-covered hand. And then from a wall of burning wreckage to one side where the light and the smoke made visibility impossible, the black Labrador howled and launched himself at the target. Dorman spun about, his head twisting and swiveling. His broken, bent hands rose up, thrashing. His tentacles and tumors quivered like a basket of snakes. The dog, a black-furred bulldozer, knocked Dorman backward to the floor. Vader! Jody screamed. The dog drove Dorman staggering into the flames where bright light and curling fire rose up through ever-growing gaps in the floor, as if the pit of hell itself lay beneath the support platform. Dorman yelped, and his tentacles wrapped around the dog. The black lab's fur caught on fire in patches, but Vader didn't seem to notice. Immune to the plague, the dog snapped his jaws, digging his fangs deep into the soft, flowing flesh of the nanotech-infected man. Dorman wrestled with the heavy animal and both tumbled to the creaking, splintering floorboards. Dorman's left foot crashed through one of the flame-filled holes. He cried out. His tentacles writhed. The dog bit ferociously at his face. Then the floor collapsed in an avalanche of flaming debris. Sparks and smoke flew upward like a landmine explosion. With a howl and a scream, both Dorman and Vader fell into the seething basement. Jody screamed and made as if to run after his dog, but Scully grabbed him fiercely by the arms. She dragged the boy back toward the opening, in safety. Coughing, Mulder followed, stumbling after her. The flames roared higher and more girders collapsed. Another concrete wall toppled into shards. Then an entire section of the floor fell in, nearly dragging them with it. 
They reached the threshold of the collapsing building, and Scully could think of nothing more than to push herself out into the fresh air, into the blessed relief, safe from the fire. The cool night seemed impossibly dark and cold as they fought their way from the flames and the wreckage. Her eyes burned, so filled with tears that she could barely see. Scully held the despairing boy, wrapping her arms around him. Mulder touched her shoulder, getting her attention as they stumbled away from the flames. She looked up to see a group of men waiting for them, staring coldly. The survivors of Lentz's team held their automatic weapons high and pointed at them. Dimar Inferno, Friday, 9.58 p.m. Stop right there, Agent Mulder, Agent Scully, the man in the lead said. There's still a chance we can bring this to a satisfactory resolution. We're not interested in your satisfactory resolution, Mulder answered with a raw cough. Scully's eyes flashed as she placed her arm protectively around the boy. You're not taking him. We know why you want him. Then you know the danger, Lentz said. Our friend Mr. Dorman just showed us all what could go wrong. This technology can't be allowed to be disseminated uncontrolled. We have no other choice. He smiled, but not with his eyes. Don't make this difficult. You're not taking him, she said more vehemently. From below, finally, Mulder could hear sirens and approaching vehicles. Response crews with flashing red and blue lights raced along the suburb streets toward the base of the hill. The second Dimar fire continued to blaze at the top of the bluff. Give us the boy now, Lentz said. Below, the sirens were getting louder, closer. Not a chance in hell, Scully answered. Fire engines and police cars raced up the hill, sirens wailing. They would reach the hilltop in Inferno in seconds. If Lentz meant to do something, it would be now. But Mulder knew if he did shoot them, he wouldn't have time to clean up his mess before the Dimar site became very public. Mr. Lentz, one of the surviving team members said. Scully took one step, paused a terribly long moment, then began to walk slowly away, one step at a time. Her determination didn't waver. Rescue workers and firefighters yanked open the chain-link gate, hauling it aside so the fire trucks could drive inside. You don't know what you're doing. Lentz said coldly. He eyed the arriving vehicles as if still gauging whether he could get away with shooting the two agents and eliminating the bodies under the very noses of the rushing emergency crews. Adam Lentz and his men stood angry and defeated, backlit by the raging inferno that burned the remains of Dimar Laboratory to the ground. As the uniformed men rushed to hook up hoses and rig their fire engine, Lentz's team stepped back, disappearing into the forest shadows. Somehow the three of them managed to reach the rental car. I'll drive, Scully, Mulder said as he popped open the driver's side door. You're a bit distracted. Mercy Hospital, Portland, Oregon, Saturday, 12.16 p.m. I don't know whether to be more astonished at the evidence of functional nanotechnology or at the lack of it. Scully shook her head and pushed the dot matrix printouts of lab scans at Mulder. He picked them up, glancing down at the numbers, graphs, and tables, but obviously didn't know what he was looking for. I take it this isn't what you expected? Absolutely no traces of nanocritters in Jody's blood. She crossed her arms over her chest. Look at the lab results. Mulder scratched his dark hair. How can that be? You saw him heal from a gunshot wound, a mortal wound. Her first evidence that something was not as she suspected, though, had been Jody's recent scrapes, scratches, and cuts after the fire. Though not serious, they failed to heal any more quickly than any other ordinary scratches. Jody Kennessy now seemed a normal boy, despite what she knew of his background. Then where did the nanocritters go? Mulder asked. Did Jody lose them somehow? Scully had no idea how to explain it. Together they entered Jody's room, where the boy sat up in bed paying little attention to the television that played loudly in the background. Considering all he had been through, the twelve-year-old seemed to be taking the ordeal well enough. He gave Scully a wan smile as he saw her. Do you know why there's no trace left of the nanocritters in your bloodstream, Jody? We can't understand it. The nanomachines healed you from the gunshot wound before. They cured you of your cancer, but they're gone now. Because I'm cured. My dad said they would shut down and dissolve when they were done. He made them so they would fix my leukemia cell by cell. He said it would take a long time, but I would get better every day. Then, when they were finished, the nanocritters were supposed to shut themselves down. Mulder raised his eyebrows at Scully. A fail-safe mechanism. I wonder if his brother Darren even knew about it. 
Mulder, that implies an incredible level of technological sophistication, she began, but then realized that the entire prospect of self-sustaining biological policemen that worked on the human body, using nothing more than DNA strands as an instruction manual, was also fantastically beyond what she had believed were modern capabilities. Jody, she said, leaning closer to the boy, we intend to release these results as widely as possible. We need to let everyone know that you are no longer carrying any signs of the nanotechnology. If you're clean, there should be no reason why those men will continue to be after you. Whatever, he said, sounding glum. The Scully didn't waste her effort in a false cheeriness. The boy would have to deal with his situation in his own way. Jody Kennessy had carried a miracle cure, not just for cancer, but probably for all forms of diseases that afflicted humanity. The nanocritters in his blood might even have offered immortality. But with the Dimar laboratory destroyed, Jeremy Dorman and the Black Lab swallowed up in the inferno, and with David Kennessy and anyone else involved in the project dead, similar nanotechnology breakthroughs would be a long time coming, if they had to be made from scratch. Scully already had an idea of how the Bureau might keep Jody safe in the long run, where they could take him. It didn't make her feel good, but it was the best option she could think of. Mulder, meanwhile, would simply write up the case, keep all of his records and his unexplained speculations, add them to his folders full of anecdotal evidence. Once again, he had nothing hard and fast to prove anything to anyone. Just another X-File. Before long, Scully figured, Mulder would need to install another few file cabinets in his cramped office, just to keep track of them all. Federal Office Building, Crystal City, Virginia, Sunday, 2.04 p.m. Adam Lentz made his final report verbally and face-to-face, -face, with no paperwork buffers between them. There would be no written record of this investigation, nothing that could be uncovered and read by the wrong sets of prying eyes. Instead, Lentz had to face down the man and tell him everything directly, in his own words. It was one of the most terrifying experiences he had ever known. A curl of acrid cigarette smoke rose from the ashtray, clinging like a deadly shroud around the man. He was gaunt, his eyes haunted, his face unremarkable, his dark brown hair combed back. Lentz stood inside the nondescript office facing the man squarely. The ashtray on the desk was crowded with stubbed-out cigarette butts. How can you be so sure? The man finally said. His voice was deceptively soft with a melodious quality. Though he had never once served in the military, at least not in any official capacity, Lentz stood ramrod straight. Scully and Mulder have tested the boy's blood extensively. We have complete access to his hospital records. There is absolutely no evidence of nanotechnology infestation. No microscopic machines, no fragments, nothing. He's clean. Eyebrows raised. So, he's been cured, but he no longer carries the cure. The man blew out a long breath of cigarette smoke. We can be happy for that, at least. We certainly wouldn't want anyone else to get their hands on this miracle. Lentz didn't answer, simply stood watchful and wary. What about Agents Mulder and Scully? The smoking man said. What do they have left? More theories, more hypotheses, but no evidence, Lentz said. Survivalist Compound, Oregon Wilderness, one month later. After Agent Scully had brought him here, the other members of the heavily guarded survivalist compound had taken Jody under their wing. Jody's story had only heightened the resolve of the compound members to keep themselves isolated and away from the interfering and destructive government they despised so much. Jody, his uncle Darren, and the other survivalists spent their days together in difficult physical work. All the members of the compound shared their own specialty with Jody, instructing him. It was as if this entire community had been ripped up and transplanted here from another time, a self-sufficient time. Jody didn't mind. He was alone now. He didn't feel close even to his Uncle Darren, but he would survive. He had overcome terminal cancer, hadn't he? The other members of the group knew to leave Jody alone when he was in one of his moods, to give him the time and space he needed. Jody wandered the barbed wire fences, looking at the trees, but mainly just being by himself and walking. Jody heard a dog bark in the distance, clear and sharp. The cold, damp air seemed to intensify the sound waves. The survivalists had many dogs in their compound, German shepherds, bloodhounds, rottweilers, dobermans, even a big poodle. 
but this dog sounded familiar. Jody looked up. The dog barked again, and now he was more certain. Come here, boy, he called. He heard a crashing sound through the underbrush, branches and vines tossed aside as a large black dog bounded toward him, emerging from the mist. The dog barked happily upon seeing him. Vader, Jody called. The dog looked unharmed, fully healed. Jody had seen Vader vanish into the flames. He had seen the Dimar facility collapse into embers, shards, and twisted girders. But Jody also knew that his dog was special, just like he'd been before all the nanocritters in his own body had died off. Vader had no such fail-safe system. The dog bounded toward him, practically knocking Jody over, licking his face, wagging his tail so furiously that it rocked his entire body back and forth. Vader wore no tags, no collar, no way to prove his identity, but Jody knew. He suspected his uncle might guess the truth, but the story he would have to tell the others was just that he had found another dog, another black lab like Vader. He would give his new pet the same name. The rest of the survivalists didn't know, and no one else in the outside world would ever need to find out. He hugged the dog, ruffling his fur and squeezing his neck. He shouldn't have doubted. He should have kept watch, hoping and waiting. His mother had said it herself. The dog would come back to him eventually. Vader always did. Mm -hmm.